until recently, Douglas was the strongest magician. From the power of his spells, mountains collapsed and the most monstrous monsters died. The Holy Flame Spirit granted him the true flame of wrath, powerful fire magic. The salamander was subject to the world's greatest wizard, Douglas. To the thriving metropolis of Baltzac, with its many adventurers, he was known by this name. That's what they called him when he accidentally became the best in the local guild. Back then, he believed without any doubt that he would continue to fight as an adventurer from that moment on, and yet his adventure license was revoked. Douglas Sama's card has expired. He could no longer accept any assignments. Ten years have passed since then. All these years Douglas Ford was unemployed. And so he, a 37-year-old man, was again at the Baldsack Adventurers Guild, where guild employee Dean asked Douglas if it was true that he wanted to go through the procedure of returning his license card. Douglas Ford replied that he had no intention of returning her. He wants them to reverse the revocation of his license. Dean didn't even understand what he was talking about right away. The young employee then came to his senses and told Douglas that he had only recently failed three C-rank quests in a row, and the guild no longer had any compelling reason to rely on him. Ford nodded understandingly and replied that he understood how difficult it was for them. Each adventurer's guild has something called collective guild points. This is a system in which, by completing tasks assigned by the guild, the adventurer and the guild itself receive guild points. An adventurer can gain various benefits with points, but with each failed mission, points are lost. In addition, the guild also receives a point advantage. If a guild loses too many points, the guild master is demoted, and the guild is closed. This could very well happen. And all because the quests he took are of no use. However, who would have thought that his points would drop so much that even his license would be revoked? 22 years have passed since he became an adventurer, and this year he turned 37 years old. His body is decrepit, and his physical indicators are steadily declining. Asthenopia, hip pain, migraine, this is an incomplete list of all the ailments that befell him. But what really torments him is a strange illness that he contracted a year ago. Every time he uses a skill, his maximum HP is reduced. Skills are extremely important for adventurers, but unfortunately the maximum HP he lost would never return. The old doctor warned Douglas that he had an unusual symptom, he had already observed it in several people. If he continues to use his skills, HP will drop to zero. It seems his body is becoming increasingly unable to bear the use of skills. The doctor admitted that he would probably die. Douglas Ford thought. Should he give up the life of an adventurer? Or should he die an adventurer? But his single mother is no longer in this world, and he has no family. He has dedicated his life to this path since he was 15 years old, and he simply has no other skills. Now that he's been through so much, he can't throw away everything he's lived for. Douglas looked at the pile of various vials, beakers and flasks obtained by the adventurers and asked Dean if these were all potions. The guild employee confirmed this and Ford stated that he is confident that as long as these potions do not run out, he will not suffer from exhaustion failures like in the past. However, Dean objected to him and said that he understood his desire, but if he is not mistaken, then at the 68th level he now has no more than 2,500 HP. With that much HP, he is no different from a novice adventurer with a level below 10. It would be better if Douglas formed a team with a healer, although they had not been here for six months. Try to take a C-rank quest, which is recommended for people with an average level of about 30. Doesn't he understand how absurd this is? Douglas tried to object, but Dean apologized and said that he really didn't want to say something like that, but had to do it. At this time, Douglas noticed the guildmaster and wanted to make a request to him. However, the guildmaster asked Douglas to stop. He told him that he knew that he also did not like to make mountains out of molehills. Douglas heard some adventure girl behind him ask the young warrior whether the old man was still grumbling. The young man replied that he had heard that Douglas' license had been revoked. The guildmaster looked sad and said, turning to Ford, that they were indebted to him because he had once been the best in the guild. They will never forget his achievements, and that's why they don't want him to die in vain. The guildmaster urged Douglas to treat them with understanding. Douglas Ford sat on the threshold in front of the guild entrance and thought hard. Taking a deep breath, he ordered himself to calm down and pull himself together. We need to face the truth. Now he has neither powerful equipment nor money. Not only did he lose his license, but he also spends a lot of money on living in this city. It's time to come to terms, obviously. He decided to first pack his things and make preparations to leave the city. Then he saw his former team on the street and the grip of sadness squeezed his heart again. This is the hero's team, from which he was kicked out six months ago. Being nearly 20 years his junior, they had advanced quickly. What he was very surprised about while traveling with them. This city, he won't get to see them again. 
It must be fate in some way. The adventurers saw Douglas and greeted him. Fanny, the adventurer healer told him that they had not seen each other for a long time, and it was a great coincidence to meet him in this city. The warrior hero Alan noted that this was no coincidence. Most likely, Douglas wanted to lie in wait for them. Edmund, the adventurer and sage added that no matter how many times he asks, the answer is the same they cannot take him back. He asked Douglas to try to see things from their point of view, those he was persecuting. Douglas replied that they were mistaken. He actually came to them once after his expulsion to ask if they could change their minds. He was indeed extremely persistent, but now he had actually decided to leave the city today. While he was getting ready, he accidentally bumped into them, so he thought of saying a final goodbye. Edmund exclaimed, was he really about to leave the city? He does not believe that there is a city where life is even easier for adventurers than here. But for what reason exactly is he leaving? Kamikaze swordsman Dario energetically remarked that despite the answer, it was heartless of him. Was his license eventually taken away? Dario asked what this huge luggage was behind his back. Is he really going to sell potions? After all, he has sunk to the very bottom, and he knows it. How much has his HP dropped since then? One more mistake, and he will definitely die. Alan told Douglas to stop suffering with bullshit, and they were in a hurry and therefore had to leave him. Douglas Ford apologized to them for delaying them with his chatter. Douglas thought for a moment. Despite his position as a hero, Alan never showed his emotions. Is it possible that he stood up for him? He turned to his friends and said that he would wish them all the best while he was traveling. Three months have passed since Douglas Ford left the metropolis of Baltzac. He continued his pointless journey. He took on any job that didn't require a license, and then, having earned enough to cover the road, he moved on to the next city. And so every day. When he turned 15, he became an adventurer because he wanted to live for humanity, despite his mother's attempts to keep him. He wanted to do good. And yet, even though he became an adventurer for this, everything now went wrong. Previously, if he fought, and there was a possibility of dying, he acted harshly, taking pleasure in it. And even when his HP began to decrease, he continued to use skills. But now he felt that he was definitely afraid of death. Although he has lost his license and the pride that he tried to maintain even at the risk of his life, despite everything, he still clings to life. Now he's all alone and he's pathetic. Douglas was breathing heavily. It was already deep night. He thought that if he managed to get out of this forest, then there would be a border checkpoint next. He realized that there were many dangers in the forest at night. If he gets to the border crossing closure, that will be good. Suddenly Douglas shuddered. He smelled blood. Ahead of him, he heard a rustling sound. Coming out into the clearing, he saw a huge wolf. The animal was breathing heavily, lying on the grass, bleeding. Douglas realized that it was Fenrir. Three years have passed since the Demon King was revived in this world, demons and monsters have become a threat to the very existence of people. However, Fenrir is rare even among demons, he does not often appear in human lands. Ford looked at his bleeding wound and assumed that he had been attacked by a hunter. He told him even though he is a demon, he doesn't want to kill him for no reason. He would like to save him if he could, but... The demon whined pitifully. Douglas understood him. He took a bottle out of his backpack and said that it would not harm him. Suddenly Douglas saw that the demon had a curse seal on it. How did he come under the curse? Curses are forbidden skills that are used to cause suffering to the enemy. The effect varies depending on the type of curse seal, but this was the curse of transformation. There was a person inside this Fenrir, a spell that turns a person into a beast. Douglas thought, why would anyone do something like that? No, the reason doesn't matter now. At this rate, this man will die. One way or another, this curse must be lifted. He calmed himself. After all, he had lifted curses more than once in the past. Even if his strength is less than in better times, this does not mean that his techniques and knowledge have disappeared. Inopportunely, Douglas remembered the doctor's words at the guild that if he continued to use his skills and his HP dropped to zero, he would die. He remembered that he no longer had the same strength. However, dispelling spells is a powerful skill. It will end the already low HP. He locked his hands and said that apparently this was the last time he would save someone as an adventurer. Douglas Ford thought it wouldn't be so bad to die this way. He decided now to remove the spell from the she-wolf, who was whining in pain. He approached her and asked her not to be afraid, he will definitely heal her. One way or another, he wanted to do good. He wanted to live for someone else, instead of a vain and aimless life. He cast a spell calling for the flickering particles of hope to gather here and now. He decided to make good use of his life one last time. Douglas began to dispel the spell. He thought that his strength would definitely fade and his HP would disappear. However, he had already finished the spell. He hoped that the she-wolf's wounds would heal. Douglas felt completely exhausted and sitting near the trunk of a huge tree. 
Ford was surprised to feel that he was alive. What's happened? After all, this is not a dream. Hasn't the seal been lifted yet? Douglas decided to reveal his status. He was surprised to see that his level had risen to 68 and his HP to 60,900. His surprise knew no bounds, he was ready to swear that last time there was only two and a half thousand HP. Has his status really returned to its previous levels? Douglas thought seriously. The spell is complete. However, not only was the seal still there, but the skill was simply reflected without having any effect. This is just his guess, but it seems that the skill was reflected and hit him. Thus, not only did he not die from HP depletion, but on the contrary, returned to his previous levels, which means he was cursed too. Now everything seems quite logical. But he thought that the reason for his condition was aging or some rare diseases. It must have disappeared after the skill bounced into it. Just think, he didn't even notice the curse pronounced on him. What kind of idiot was he? However, it had to manifest itself as an illness in status. Why hasn't anyone noticed this yet? So who cast the curse on him? Douglas decided he could think about it later. Now we need to get back to helping the demon. The bleeding does not stop, something needs to be done urgently. Since the dispelling spell was reflected from him therefore, a forbidden spell was cast on her. The forbidden spell is one of the most powerful curses and only the one who cast it can remove it. In other words, he is unable to turn this Fenrir back into a human. Then it dawned on him. If only the caster can lift the curse, then all he has to do is become it. When he began to fall behind Alan and the others in terms of ability, he wanted to close the gap, so he desperately studied information regarding skills. He has one copy skill that allows him to transform his voice and the appearance of someone he knows. He can use it to take the form of the one who cast the curse. At least he'd like to say so, but he has no idea who he is. Therefore, he will have to exchange information through memories using the appropriate skill. Having found out about the caster, he will change his appearance and in this state will lift the curse. In theory this should work. However, using skills in parallel or resorting to using a second one is not so easy. There is only one person who has achieved such mastery. This is the hero Alan. Since it was for this unique ability that he became famous, the king awarded him the title of hero. That's how unique the ability to use parallel skills is. Regardless, now that his powers are back, it's definitely worth a try. Douglas concentrated. The gates of the soul and mind open and become a part of it. The memory-sharing spell plunged Douglas into a crisp black and white world. Douglas saw what a charmer he was. Now he needed to take on his appearance. It's okay. Even after using multiple skills, he will no longer lose HP. Everything should work out for him. He began to recite the spell, common sense, what lies behind the form. After that, he used the imitation spell. Douglas realized that he would not last long. We need to act faster. Simultaneously, imitation and dispersion must be applied. Dispel a unique spell. Ford felt a sharp gust of wind. Instead of a she-wolf, Douglas Ford saw a cute creature. It was a girl, very young. Douglas turned to her and said that no matter what, he was glad she was okay. He asked her how her voice was and if she could talk. The girl nodded and, stuttering, replied that she could. Douglas thought that apparently this girl was very quiet. He had no idea how to behave with children her age at such moments. He placed his hand on her head and cast a healing spell. Then he cast a spell of complete restoration. He asked the girl if she was okay and if she was in pain. The girl replied that she was fine and asked if he was a great magician. After all, he cured her. Douglas replied that he was just a friendly, middle-aged old man. He found himself still not introducing himself. He said his name was Douglas Ford, and the girl said her name was Ravi. Douglas asked her if she remembered the city she lived in. He can walk her home at dawn. Ravi replied that she had nowhere else to go back to. Ford asked what happened to her family. The girl replied that she had no family either. Douglas realized that she, like him, was completely alone. Still, he asked, there must be a place where she lived before the curse. Ravi exclaimed in horror that she did not want to go back. Anything, just not there. Ford noticed that she was shaking violently. He thought that this girl was so afraid that he wondered what happened to her. He calmed the girl down and said that if she didn't want to, then he wouldn't do anything against her will. Douglas Ford was at a loss. Ravi was afraid of something. Looks like this girl has her reasons. You just need to leave it in the nearest city. It's a bad idea though. He has several acquaintances. He told Ravi that there is a city called Baltzak, and he will try to find someone to take care of her there. He warned the girl that the journey was long. He asked her if she minded. The girl replied that she didn't mind if it wasn't difficult for him. Douglas assured that it was not difficult for him at all. He took the cooked dish off the fire and said that he wanted to cook another one. He decided to cut the apples into thin slices and then fried them individually. 
If you fry them on both sides, they will become soft and tender. After that, he wished the girl bon appetit. For dinner they had a wonderful table, bread with apples and soup with pork. Ravi admired the smell of the soup and Douglas warned her that it was very hot. Ravi eagerly began to eat. Douglas Ford was very pleased that she liked his cooking. He told the girl that the fire produces an extraordinary interaction between bittersweet apples and dry bread. You can also make a rich dashy broth from dried pork. It is necessary to cook until the meat gives off fat and becomes soft. Douglas heard the girl sigh heavily. He asked what was wrong with her. Did you not like something? Or maybe something hurts her. Ravi replied that everything was delicious and thanked him for dinner. After that, she looked Douglas in the eyes and said that she was very grateful to him for saving her. Douglas thought that he wanted to live for someone to do good. He probably should have told Ravi the same thing. The fire cast glare into the dark emptiness of the forest, near which sat a middle-aged man and a mysterious girl named Ravi. Their fleeting journey had begun. Morning came and Ravi opened her eyes. She felt very uncomfortable sleeping while Douglas was watching over her. The man greeted the girl and asked if she slept well. He had heard that children grow up in their sleep. It was time to hit the road, but before he left, Douglas had something to do. The bags that Douglas had in his backpack became Ravi's shoes. The former adventurer just tied a string around them, and although they looked rather poor, they could move around. The girl thanked him and said that she would take care of them. Douglas thought this girl was very nice. After the preparations for the journey were completed, Douglas decided it was time to hit the road. He called the girl and saw that she was looking at something, holding the thing in her hands. The man approached her, and Ravi showed him a necklace that sparkled and shimmered with its precious stones. Douglas looked at the expensive piece of jewelry and asked if Ravi remembered anything about the necklace. Ford could not even imagine that something like this could be lost so deep in the mountains. As a magician, he knew that by using special devices, the effects of spells and magical skills were enhanced. There is a high chance that this necklace was used to curse Ravi. Douglas twirled the jewelry in his hands and asked the girl if she would like to wear it. He has already dispelled the spell, so it poses no danger to Ravi. Since the girl refused, the former adventurer suggested that she sell the necklace in the city. He decided to keep it for now. Ravi agreed. There are no long journeys in good company. Douglas and Ravi were in the northern region of the Kingdom of Laos, and their path lay to the metropolis of Baltzac, which was located in the southwest of the country, so the travelers were moving south. This part of the region had untouched forests and wilderness everywhere, and roads had not yet been built. The only people passing through here are traveling merchants. There are not a single carriage here, which only travel along the main roads. Douglas Ford decided that it was very boring to remain silent in company, so on the way he was more talkative than usual. He wasn't very good at talking, but Ravi listened carefully to his chatter. Ravi seemed to enjoy the stories of his past travels. The man thought with pleasure that he had just met the girl, but he feels differently, not like before, when he wandered aimlessly around the world. Douglas once again remembered the proverb that there are no long journeys in good company. It really is more pleasant to be in company. Finally, they reached the small village of McFadden with a hotel, which was combined with a store and a church in the northern part of the village. Douglas knew her well because he had spent the night here the previous day. He greeted the store owner warmly, who responded in kind. Douglas asked her for two sets of clothes, shoes and underwear for the girl, as well as some soup and a towel. The hostess nodded understandingly, mistaking Ravi for Ford's daughter. She asked them to wait for one minute. The hostess asked Douglas what kind of shoes they preferred, wood or leather. The man replied that he would prefer shoes that do not hurt when worn for a long time. The store owner suggested taking wooden ones because they will always protect from moisture, and they are more resistant to water and cold compared to leather. After that, she handed over the underwear and said that children grow quickly, and she chose a size larger. Then she asked if they needed anything else. Douglas asked for another leather flask, but the hostess sadly replied that they had already run out. Douglas decided that he would look for a flask in the nearest town. At this time they saw an old man who approached them and asked if they were really heading to Addington. The old man said that he had his own shop in Addington, and they could meet there. Usually he evaluates the goods that people bring to him, using his skills, but sitting in his shop all the time is very boring. So he leaves the store to his son, and he goes off to sell small items. Douglas, hearing these words, turned to the appraiser and asked him to evaluate the necklace. How much money does he think he can get for it? The old appraiser looked at the necklace with interest. He suggested that it was an antique. He asked to wait while he used his skill assessment. The hostess turned to Grandpa Theo and said that he could appreciate this decoration even without skills. Theo looked closely at the necklace through his pocket magnifying glass and declared that it was the black pearl. 
he assumed that the market would fetch about 20 silver coins for it. The hostess immediately offered them to buy the black pearl if they wanted. Douglas was surprised to note that 20 pieces of silver would be enough for a whole month's supply of food, not a bad price for the black pearl. However, this necklace was used for a forbidden spell. The magical effects of gemstones are much stronger compared to regular ones. Most likely, this is a far from unusual black pearl. This is a black obsidian pearl. The name and shape are similar, but the cost is radically different. Douglas realized that this thing was a very valuable item that could only be obtained from the eyes of a rare black tiger shrimp. Is this the eye of a black tiger shrimp? Then this thing is very expensive. Douglas read the spell from the Book of Knowledge, Evaluative Judge, and realized that this thing definitely resembles a black obsidian pearl. Theo was very surprised that Douglas could use the assessment skill, he thought that they were travelers, but in fact they were traitors. Ford told the old man that they were just ordinary wanderers, but as he could see, he had some skills. The old evaluator agreed that it was quite possible for high-level adventurers to acquire some skills, although even if that was the case, it meant that he was a very high-level skill user. Douglas replied that he was not such an outstanding adventurer. Even though he has the skill of estimating, he doesn't understand prices, so he apologizes to Theo if he made him feel bad. The old man chuckled vaguely. Theo laughed heartily and told Douglas that he was completely fooled by his modesty. However, with the skill of assessment, even if he is not a merchant, he is already almost like a brother to them. The old man put on a serious face and said that he didn't have that much money in his hands right now, but if he went to his shop in Addington, he would buy the necklace, at least at market value. He told the former adventurer that his name was Theo, and he would look forward to their next meeting. Douglas was not against it. After that, Douglas and Robbie headed to the hotel. The girl behind the counter recognized the man and asked if they would like to stay there for the night. Douglas answered in the affirmative and said that something had happened since he visited them recently. The owner of the establishment noticed the girl and asked who was with him. Last time she wasn't with him. She looked sternly at Douglas and said that he didn't look like a kidnapper, so she wouldn't poke her nose into someone else's business. But even if she is a child, she intends to charge her as if she were an adult. Ford, bewildered, agreed to her demand. The hostess, meanwhile, noticed that this girl was pretty dirty. She stated that she could not allow her to sleep in this condition. She ordered Douglas to wash her thoroughly before entering the house. The owner of the establishment promised to take the wash tub out to the backyard. The former adventurer was forced to agree with the hostess. Douglas, carrying water in a bucket from the well, reflected that since he could now use skills, he did not need to travel just to get water. He called upon the Holy Spirit of Water to give him the blessed water. He called upon the magic of water, Ondine. Ravi happily splashed in the tub in the backyard of the establishment, and water from the well flowed into the tub by itself. Ravi, seeing the magical effect of water, was delighted. She was shocked by her new friend's abilities. Douglas was in high spirits. He could use his powers again like before. He never understood what it was like until recently. Then Ford noticed that Ravi was looking at him strangely. He asked her what was the matter. The girl replied that she then found a ring next to the necklace, but forgot to tell him about it. Douglas saw a ring on Ravi's palm, and the girl asked if it could be sold too. Douglas Ford took the ring and memories came flooding back to him. He remembered Alan telling him that his parents were killed in front of him when he was a child, and he is going to avenge them. Alan swore on the ring that his mother left him. Is it Alana? The former adventurer turned his gaze back to the ring. This couldn't be a mistake. In his hands he held the dragon ruby. This is undoubtedly a memory of his parents that he treasured. Douglas didn't remember him trusting him with the ring and it is unlikely that it could have accidentally gotten into his luggage. If so, then why was this ring in the mountains? Of course he already knew why. He just didn't want to believe it. He regained his former strength after being unexpectedly hit by a dispel spell. The cursed accessory that remained near Ravi and the ring. The one who cursed him is named Alan. He's creepy as hell. And why did he stand up for him then? But it's not only that. Losing your license, and then just waiting for death. He doomed him to this fate, even though he was his comrade. What had he done to make him so angry? No matter how Douglas thought about it, nothing came to mind. Apparently, this is the problem. It must have been because of his indifference that he did not notice someone's offense. He was brought out of his thoughts by a question from Ravi, who, seeing Douglas's condition, asked what was wrong with him. The man replied that nothing special was happening to him, but the girl did not agree with him. Ravi stated that pain was written on his face, just like when they first met. Douglas sighed and thought that he was no liar, and Ravi was a very perceptive child. He squatted down next to the girl and decided that there was no point in lying about his feelings anymore. 
He turned to Ravi and said that once upon a time this ring was treasured by one of his former comrades, so they won't sell it. Douglas thought for a moment and stated that they would return the ring to the previous owner, and he will definitely find out why Alan cursed him. At this time, the owner of the hotel came out into the backyard and irritably asked them why the hell they were all wet. She busily approached the tub and said that she herself would give the child a bath for him, and he should at least put himself in order. Douglas weakly protested that he could handle it himself. However, the woman replied that Ravi was still a girl and he should show at least a little respect. Ford was forced to comply. Douglas went to the well and began to shave. He thought it was normal not to worry about such things since she was still a child, but the owner was still right. He doesn't know much about this kind of thing. At this time, the hostess approached the well and asked his forgiveness for the wait. Douglas saw Ravi with the owner who patted the girl on the head and said that she had shortened her bangs with her permission and asked his opinion about it. Ford saw that the girl was very pleased. Douglas was struck by her beauty and purity. She transformed so that the former magician could not say a word. The hostess was forced to wave her hands in front of his eyes and urge him to say something. Douglas had a hard time answering that Ravi was very cute for a child. After this, the hostess invited them to have a little snack. To do this, they went inside the establishment and sat down at the table. While placing the food on the table, the hostess turned to Douglas and said that she had been wondering all the time why he had returned to such a village again. And then she came up with an idea. He went on a trip to pick up his daughter, didn't he? She looked at the girl and asked if traveling with daddy must be fun. Ravi nodded silently. Douglas remembered that Ravi had previously said that she had no family. He thought that Ravi must really miss his father, or maybe he has already gone to the next world. He still hasn't been curious or questioned her because it seems to him that the girl doesn't want to touch on this topic. However, even if they parted in Baltzac, they would have to travel for several months. It will be a rather lonely story because they are complete strangers to each other. What distance should he keep with Ravi? He calmed himself and decided that everything would be fine as long as he got closer to her step by step. Sitting at the table, Douglas counted the remaining money. There weren't many of them. He thought that he would soon have to look for a job. Then he noticed that Ravi had already eaten. She said that lunch was very tasty. Douglas suggested that she rest for a while and then go to the hotel. Five days have passed since Douglas and Ravi set off south from the village of McFadden. They finally arrived in the charity town of Addington, where Theo's grandfather had a shop in a large house. Addington is built on gently rolling hills and on the higher ground on the north bank is Matlock's Refuge. Large cities usually have orphanages, but most of them suffer from serious financial difficulties, so virtually none of them can match this one in elegance. Douglas did not know the reason why the shelters in this city were still decent. The friendly girl asked them if they were travelers, and then she praised this wonderful orphanage. Douglas thought that the reason for the excellent condition of the orphanage was that the director had once succeeded in trade and was now investing in the education of orphans. Douglas noticed that there were quite remarkable people in this city. This was the fourth time he had heard a similar story about this man's positive reputation. Ford, walking down the street of this pleasant town with his child, thought that he needed to make sure that Ravi did not feel under his control. The girl looked with surprise and delight at the horse-drawn carriages moving through the streets. Douglas asked her if she had ever ridden in a carriage. Ravi replied that she had never ridden in one, and Ford suggested that she go further south, so that she could also see stagecoaches there. He promised the girl to take her for a ride in it sooner or later. Douglas was happy to notice how Ravi smiled more often. It must be because of her new short bangs. When they approached the orphanage, they saw the director on the threshold, whom the children thanked for the sweets. The director, meanwhile, asked them not to worry and to look at their feet. When the former adventurer saw the director, he thought with surprise, is this really the man? Douglas turned his attention to the director of the orphanage and the children around him, who were dressed almost like nobles. He realized that in comparison with them, the clothes he bought for Ravi were too poor. Also, her expression is noticeably different from when she was happy when she heard about the carriages. This is the face people have when they really want something. She seems to be really jealous of these kids because of these cute outfits. Suddenly, both of the principal's children jumped towards Ravi and Douglas warned her of the danger. With great difficulty, the adults managed to prevent the accident. Douglas asked Ravi if she was okay. The principal also asked his children if they had been hurt and asked Douglas for forgiveness on behalf of the children. Ford replied that they weren't very attentive either, he helped Ravi up. The director said that it seemed he had jumped to conclusions, deciding that the two of them were father and daughter. Douglas was surprised. How could this person guess? The director replied that the distance they were keeping was noticeable. Even when Douglas extended his hand, this girl doubted how to take it. 
If the two of them were father and daughter, this would never have happened. The director asked what kind of relationship they had. Douglas thought with alarm that maybe this man suspected that he was a child abductor. The former adventurer replied that they were just father and daughter out of a sense of duty. The director suggested that his life had also changed dramatically, and he already had a lot of worries. He asked if he himself was caring for a little girl who was not related to him by blood. Douglas realized that he had said too much. However, the man noticed that although it was impudent of him to say such a thing, it seemed that the two of them were in trouble. The man stated that he was the head of a shelter in this city and his name was Matlock. He offered to give him some advice if Douglas wanted. Ford did not mind listening to the advice of such an authoritative director. Matlock suggested that it must be difficult to look after a little girl. Traveling with a child limits the distance an adult can walk, and he also can't just stand in front of the child while he sleeps and was he on patrol last night. More importantly, he is confident that his expenses are higher than when he was on his own. He has many children entrusted with him due to various situations so he could help him. Douglas thought that he could not do this because he was offering him to leave Ravi in the orphanage. No, this conversation doesn't have to end like this. Douglas thanked Principal Matlock for his worries but assured him that they were fine. After that, he took the girl by the hand and they quickly left. The director just sighed, looking after them. Douglas and Ravi returned to the hotel. Ravi seemed not herself. She just looked at the clothes that Douglas bought her and was silent. Apparently, she was comparing her clothes to those of the children from the orphanage. Ravi called out to Douglas. The girl asked if these robes cost him much for her. The former adventurer replied that it was cheap. Ravi replied that she was very happy about it. Douglas realized that it wasn't his clothes that Ravi was worried about. Or is she just thinking about him? But wasn't she consumed with envy? Douglas almost forgot that he ran away because of the director's suggestion. But he wonders what Ravi's opinion was on the matter. There were many children about her age there. They can live there without any discomfort. Is it possible that Ravi wants to go to an orphanage? He told the girl that if this was true, then he asked her forgiveness for the fact that he refused the director without thinking. Douglas Ford told Ravi that if she wanted, he would ask the director tomorrow to take her to the orphanage. He wanted to know how Ravi felt. He asked her if there was any need for him to ask. The girl nodded, and Douglas felt relieved. After that, Ford asked Ravi to wait for him, and he slammed the door and went outside. Douglas thought that Ravi did not want to go to the orphanage at all. However, if this is the case, then at least he wants to dress her up nicely. If she remained like this, she would feel miserable wherever they went. Douglas bought something from the store and hoped that Ravi would be happy with this gift. When he returned to the hotel, he did not find the girl there. The room was empty. On the table, Douglas saw a note in which Ravi thanked him for everything and said that she had a lot of fun with him. Below it said she was going to an orphanage. At the end of the note was her name. Douglas was very upset. He had no experience raising children, and he was already thinking about sending Ravi to one of his friends. If it is just an opportunity to live without any inconvenience, then the location does not matter. He told Ravi later that he wanted to know how she felt and just as she responded, he deliberately avoided her gaze and ran away. The former adventurer threw the gift on the floor and told himself that he should not follow her. The next day, Douglas went to Theo's department store. He walked up to the front door and heard his grandfather, the appraiser, arguing with his son about inventory. The son claimed that his father was too old for this, and Theo insisted that he was much stronger than his puny ass. Ford opened the door, and the faces of the relatives took on friendly expressions. Grandfather Theo recognized Douglas and expressed joy that he had come to his store. He clarified the purpose of his coming. He came to sell his necklace, didn't he? Douglas replied that he had come about this, but that the necklace originally belonged to another child with whom he interacted at one time. So he decided to return it later, so he is very sorry, but he will not be able to sell him this necklace ever. Theo couldn't understand where Douglas was going with this, but he asked him what happened to the girl who owned this jewelry. The man told him everything. Theo, sitting on a high stool, said that then this girl was lucky and he was sure that she would be happy. After a short silence, he added that he did not like this man. He had never heard of a merchant who didn't hang on to his money. Son Theo explained that his father is practically the only one in this city who speaks badly about the director of the orphanage. He asked Douglas not to pay attention to him. However, the old man continued to talk. He turned to Douglas again and said that he had made an excellent choice in entrusting this girl to director Matlock, since even when looking for adoptive parents, he would refuse anyone who was not a nobleman. Children raised in an orphanage are cared for in such a way that they can survive independently in big cities. There are already many children who have flown away from the director's nest. Douglas asked, because this city is already very comfortable to live in, and they still leave it. 
The old man replied that this place is a big city in its own way, but isn't it said that the eastern continent is in a completely different level? The old man asked Ford if he didn't know that if you go southeast from here, you can get to the port, and from there you can cross the ocean. Douglas asked Theo when he said about crossing the ocean if he meant the port city of Shipton. But the only people who can moor at Shipton are small short-range fishing boats and merchant ships. He's had some disagreements with the guild, so he's pretty sure passenger ships haven't stopped here in years. Ten years ago, the eastern continent was subject to fierce invasions by the demon king, and there was no end to the demon's cruelty. This story was told to him when he traveled east from Shipton to destroy them, so he remembers it well. Son Theo replied that this was true, but the director gained great influence when he returned back with his acquaintances on a merchant ship, so he can send for the ship at any time. Douglas was surprised. This is impossible. Alan's group must have managed to temporarily secure the eastern continent. However, now the city is back in business. Douglas thought that to begin with, it didn't seem like this merchant knew about the Demon King's incursions. Is it possible that the director of the orphanage sends the children away without knowing anything? But whoever delivers the children always arrives safely at the eastern port. If the director doesn't know about it, then that person is simply hiding them. But for what reason exactly? Regardless, Douglas couldn't leave Ravi in such a place. He quickly said goodbye to Theo and his son and headed towards the orphanage. He told them that he was going to bring Ravi back. Having already left the room, he shouted that he would return. Douglas reached the shelter and knocked on the door. The director himself opened it and asked Ford what business he had with him. Douglas directly stated that he had come to pick up Ravi. The director made a surprised face and asked how he could take her. After all, this girl herself wanted to come here, and she told him about it yesterday. Douglas replied that he knew this, but there had been a misunderstanding. He insistently told the director that he intended to take Ravi and asked him to let him see her. Matlock agreed and said that most likely the girl is now in the kindergarten with other children. He even volunteered to show Douglas the way. The two of them went out into the garden where the children were playing. Douglas looked around for Ravi but didn't see her anywhere. Finally, he noticed her in the far corner of the garden and ran towards her. Ravi was very surprised and asked the man why he was here. Douglas said that he came for her to take her with him. At first the girl was very happy and then suddenly lowered her eyes. After a pause, Ravi said that he would have problems if she stayed with him. Douglas remembered the director telling him at that time that it was difficult to look after a little girl, and that traveling with a child limited the distance he could go, and also he could not ignore the child while sleeping. Douglas was so self-absorbed then that he completely forgot to think about Ravi, who was listening to all this behind his back. She, of course, also heard about how the director was worried about his increased expenses. Given Ravi's calm, reserved disposition, he should have guessed her feelings. It always seemed to her that her very existence would become a heavy burden for him. This has only now dawned on Douglas. He looked the girl in the eyes and asked her for forgiveness. He said he failed to take her feelings into account properly, and in the end, he didn't understand everything that way. He asked Ravi to forgive him. The girl sheepishly replied that he did not need to apologize. Douglas said that he never even thought that she would be a burden to him. On the contrary, he will be glad if they can continue traveling together. Then he asked Ravi if she wanted to come back to him. The girl asked Douglas if it was true that she would not be a burden to him and, waiting for an affirmative answer, she jumped into his arms. She cried and said that she didn't want to leave at all. At this time, Douglas heard the director applauding them. He laughed and said it was great, and he was so touched he could cry. Director Matlock said that he wanted to help many people, but he couldn't detain her now. Therefore, he is ready to escort them to the exit. However, Douglas wanted to ask Matlock something before he left. He said that he had heard that all the children from the orphanage were later sent to the eastern continent, but wasn't that the same as sending children across the ocean? The director did not deny this and said that it was so. That's why he sometimes sees the children off and goes to the eastern continent to check on them. It is difficult for him to visit his children often, but the last time he was there was a year ago. Douglas asked, this must be a very good place. The director replied that it was very lively there and there was a festive atmosphere every day. The kids who moved in look very happy. Douglas shook his head doubtfully. The former adventurer said, looking into the headmaster's eyes, that three years have passed since the eastern continent was once again tormented by the four heavenly demon lords, including the industrial city of Bourbon, which is under their control. And yet the director claims that the children seemed very happy living in such a city. In general, there is no way for a traveler to visit there. And even if someone manages to get into the city by pure chance, he is sure that they will clearly not be allowed to leave it. The director laughed nervously and said that he asked not to speak loudly. This can't be true. He saw it with his own eyes. 
Douglas objected and said that he too had seen it with his own eyes. The director suddenly turned to the children and asked them to come into the house for a while. As the children disappeared through the exit door, Douglas told Matlock it seemed like he intended to get them out if something happened. The director didn't seem to understand what was going on. Suddenly his good-natured face took on the appearance of an evil demon. He said that there was no need to show his favorite product, maybe he should kill Douglas. Shelter workers immediately appeared in the garden armed with what? It seems they were also involved in this matter. Douglas moved Ravi behind him and told her to remember what he was about to tell her. No matter what happens, he will protect her. The director ordered his accomplices to kill Douglas and Ravi. The shelter staff prepared to carry out the order and Douglas turned to the goddess, guardian of the sacred land of Absolute Zero. He asked her to give him a chilling kiss. Douglas attracted the magic of ice. Hell, a terrible icy crash was heard throughout the garden, which pinned down the attacking criminals. Matlock shouted indignantly that he turned out to be an attack skill user. Douglas asked Ravi to stay put and, stepping towards the director, asked him where the children who left the orphanage were. Madlock replied that he did not know. Ford then warned him that he could simply turn his entire body into ice and give him an icy death. The director asked him if he was threatening him. He's just bluffing. No one can tell from his face that he is capable of murder. A strange smile appeared on Douglas's face. The director hiccuped and was surprised by Ford's creepy face. Douglas simply copied his face, although this perhaps should not have been done. He invited Matlock to confess everything. Douglas pointed at the cold shelter staff and said that there were others here, and they seemed to know what would happen next. He'll just ask for them as soon as the director dies. The director fearfully and hastily announced that he had sold the children to some perverted nobles in brothels. Douglas asked Matlock to name these brothels. Suddenly, the director screamed at the top of his lungs, asking the military police to help him because this dirty man was going to kill him. The director exclaimed that he had let his guard down. He still has one skill he can use. Matlock summoned the flame of fury, fire magic, salamander. He stated that since he could kill him, everything would remain a secret. No one in this city would trust a wanderer like him, and tomorrow he will be in the position of director. Douglas put his palm forward, stopping the fire magic and turning it in the other direction. Madlock realized his mistake too late. He shouted that he was guilty and asked for mercy. However, Douglas Ford did not pay attention to this. The director's body was on fire. After it was over, Ravi rushed to Douglas and asked if he was okay. At the same time, she called him daddy. Ford replied that he was fine and said that she had just called him daddy. At this time, two police officers appeared and heard Matlock screaming. They saw a strange picture. The half-frozen employees of the shelter cried out for help and director Matlock himself lay unconscious on the ground. The police approached Douglas and confronted him. They asked him to explain what happened here. After this, Douglas managed to convince the military police of the veracity of their story. A list of clients found in director Matlock's room helped with this. The police were serious about finding the traffic children by any means necessary and returning them home. No one could believe that everyone in the city had been deceived by this director Matlock. It was decided that now volunteers would look after the children of the orphanage, replacing each other. The fact that caring people live in the city is their only salvation. Soon Douglas and Ravi returned to the hotel. In the room on the floor, the girl found a crumpled box and asked Ford what happened to it. He replied that it was supposed to be a gift for her. The girl asked Douglas if she could open it, he didn't mind. Ravi opened the box and found a bow in it. Douglas admitted that he bought it when he left the house and left her there. He felt ashamed that she had to wear cheap clothes, so he acted strangely at that moment. Douglas asked Ravi for forgiveness. She replied that she was also sorry that she left alone. She asked Douglas for permission to wear a bow. He volunteered to help her. When the bow appeared in place, Douglas noticed that it suited her very well, and Ravi warmly thanked him for the gift. Then she asked Ford why he gave her a bow. He replied that when they met the children from the orphanage, she looked at their charming dresses with envy. Ravi blushed. She admitted with embarrassment that she was not looking at the dresses, but at the sweets they had. Douglas looked at her confusedly and asked, were they sweets? They laughed merrily. Douglas and Ravi sat at the open window until nightfall. Douglas said that when it comes to anger, the despair of sadness, it is through a joyful encounter that people overcome them. As a single parent, it seems he still has a lot to learn as a father. He told the girl that the end of the night was still far away, and they could admire the moonlight. At breakfast, Douglas told Ravi that the military police had ordered them to remain in this city due to the incident with Director Matlock. They are likely to remain in Addington for the next four to five days. In the meantime, he is going to take on some part-time work to earn some money for their trip. But what will Ravi do? Will he wait for him at the hotel? 
The girl replied that she wanted to stay with him, but if this was work, then she could wait. Douglas thought about it and said that in that case they would go together. Ravi asked him if she would get in his way. Douglas assured her that she would not disturb him in the least, and most importantly, he would be able to protect her in the best possible way, because there is no safer place than next to him. After this, Douglas proposed. He said that from now on, wherever they go, they should maintain a father-daughter relationship. This is also to ensure that a situation like the one that happened the other day does not happen again. So from now on, he will call Ravi his daughter in front of others, and she should call him daddy. However, if she doesn't want it, then they won't do it. Ravi asked Douglas if she could call him that now. He replied that of course she could call him that whenever she wanted. The girl carefully said the word dad. As if tasting the word, she called him daddy and asked Douglas if that sounded strange. He replied that he did not say that. In fact, he was very embarrassed. Douglas decided that now was the time to take on the quest. Two days later, on the day of the quest, he and Ravi set off. Douglas asked her if she was cold. The girl replied that she was fine. At this time, Douglas drew attention to a group of people who were also heading in their direction to complete the quest. One of this group glared angrily in their direction and said reproachfully, turning to Douglas, that he had taken on the task with a child and was even looking down on them. If this is just a walk for him, then he needs to go home now. Douglas Ford replied that they were not causing them any trouble. He decided that this man was the commander of the self-defense forces they were traveling with this time. He thought that this commander looked quite formidable, being the complete opposite of him. The task this time was from the locals to pacify the Red-Eyed Dragon. The quests that the Adventurer's Guild usually offers involve personal matters, so the rewards and difficulty are often low. However, quests like this, which do not go through a guild and come directly from a city or country, can sometimes be taken even without a license, at the cost of higher difficulty. Red-Eyed Dragons are incredibly ferocious and aggressive magical beasts. Their favorite treat is people. And every year, waking up from hibernation, they begin to create nests in the mountains not far from human settlements. So this city, Addington, has been slaying dragons for several years now. In a small clearing in the middle of the forest, the self-defense squad took a lunch break. Douglas and Ravi settled down nearby. Ravi devoured the egg sandwiches with gusto and praised them for their light taste. Douglas was pleased to hear this. The girl asked if Dad really prepared all this. He replied that he had prepared egg sandwiches and beef meatball soup this morning using the hotel kitchen. A young man from the self-defense group approached him and asked what they were eating. Douglas replied that it was meatball soup. One of the party members said that this dish gave off a very appetizing aroma and the soup would definitely warm his frozen bones. Douglas thought that they still had some soup left. He looked at Ravi and she nodded quietly. Then Douglas turned to the members of the self-defense squad and asked if they would like to try the soup. They don't have much, so they'll have to share one pot, but he's sure it will still keep them a little warm. The warriors were surprised. Could it be that even though they treated the two of them rather badly, he was still talking like that? Douglas advised them not to worry about this, because when working with strangers of course they had to be on their guard. He held out a bowler hat, and the members of the squad thought that this guy seemed to be not bad. When they tried the soup, they were truly delighted. They asked Douglas what kind of meat he put in there. Ford noticed, away from the main detachment, the commander who had spoken to him at the beginning of the campaign. Catching his gaze, one of the squad members said that if he was thinking about that bearded man, then just let him leave him alone. The young man, whose name was Noish, asked why don't they go and talk to him themselves. Douglas realized that this man was leading them on a mission, and they shouldn't spoil their relationship with him. He approached the bearded man and said that he was freezing by staying here. Why don't he have some soup with them? The bearded man rose to his feet and irritably asked why they were attacking him with their damn food. He shouted, have they already forgotten why they are here? If they are finished with food, then they immediately leave. He ordered everyone to hurry up and get ready for the road. Everyone fearfully began to carry out orders. A few minutes later the entire squad moved on. At this time, the leader told Douglas to come to him. Douglas, holding Ravi's hand, approached the group. He saw huge animal tracks ahead. Noosh stated that red-eyed dragons have a habit of stealing nests from other species. There is a great danger that the dragon has begun to create a nest at the end of these tracks. One of the rangers agreed with him. This must be true, given their size. They got lucky this year, the bearded man said that then we need to hurry up. However, Douglas interrupted him and said that they should abandon this path. All the squad members stared at him in bewilderment. Douglas leaned over to the footprints and told them to look closely at them. The bearded man mockingly said that he thought that these were just tracks of deer or wild boar. Then the commander promised Douglas that if he got in the way, he would send him flying. 
Douglas pointed to the tracks and argued that if it had been a deer, there would have been no hoof marks. And if it had been a wild boar, there would have been more tracks. He stated that the front and shape of the main hoof indicated a large creature. This feature means that the tracks belong to the mythical beast unicorn. The squad members were surprised. A mythical beast can hardly be seen once, but why then can't they follow this path? After all, unicorns are very careful, so if you don't get close, they won't attack people. Douglas explained that the problem is not with a unicorn itself. The fact is that the unicorn, who should be very careful, was in such a panic that he forgot to erase his tracks. The only possibility of such a circumstance for them is when they are running away from a huge monster that devours even mythical beasts. One of the members of the self-defense unit confidently stated that he had never heard of anything like this. Douglas replied that it was only because they didn't know. It is clear that this is difficult to believe. However, the former adventurer insisted on heading back today. They will be at a disadvantage against some huge unknown monster. Even in such extremely rare cases, there is a significant chance of death. The warriors came close to agreeing with Douglas. One of them said that it would be too late if they were seriously injured. The bearded leader swore loudly and told Douglas that his chatter was annoying as hell. Let him pull himself together. He turned to his soldiers and said, are they all such fools? This guy just chickened out by being here. After all, he would be ashamed to run alone. So his plan is to try to take them with him. Girls who want to give a shit don't be shy, and he will never communicate with such cowards. Douglas tried to stop the leader, but he had already gone forward following the tracks. Noish looked at Douglas and said he was sorry. Although the two of them, father and daughter, will be left alone, they still need to go back. However, Douglas said that they would also go with them, they would never abandon them just like that. Noish told Douglas that he was also a father, although he was very different from their bearded man. Douglas asked him, the whole squad and this leader, father and sons. The young man replied that he was not their real father. This bearded man has never been married. However, the other guys owe him a favor since he saved their lives or something, so even if they are scared, they will follow him like a father. However, despite the fact that he has been serving in self-defense for several years, he cannot stand this bearded man. He said he wants to resign already. Douglas thought about it. Perhaps Noish knows that this leader is difficult to deal with due to his arrogance. But if he says that the leader is like a father to them, then that's a completely different story. Douglas understood him because now he also has something to protect. He turned to Noish. Douglas said that today was the first time he met their leader, but he was just clumsy compared to the others. Even during lunch break, he looked like he was the only one looking after their weapons. When he spoke of the danger, he was the first to rush into the mountains. Douglas added that he may scare them, but that doesn't mean he hates them. He trusts that the leader acted in such a way that they would not get hurt. Noish replied that if this is so, then he is just some kind of dead weight who cannot even suffer. Then Noish turned to Douglas and asked if he thought she was the same girl. Ford asked in surprise, what did he mean? Suddenly everyone heard a loud scream. Nobody could understand what happened. Douglas picked Ravi up and ran in the direction where the screams were coming from. Then he covered the girl's eyes with his hand and ordered her not to look. What the hell happened here? The squad members saw the remains of red-eyed dragons scattered over a large area. There was so much blood around that no one could understand how these dragons could just be devoured. The leader exclaimed that the red-eyed dragons are B-rank difficulty beasts, but yet there was a creature devouring them. Douglas thought that he was right. For such a creature to be near a city that has no dungeons nearby is something strange, Douglas Ford looked closer and saw red coal, which is used to mask odors. He noticed the bloody stains indicating a tail. It couldn't be. He breathed in greedily. Ahead of him, he heard the rustling of leaves. A second later, a terrible monster appeared in front of them. It was a demonic black dragon. Dragon King, SS rank, he was capable of destroying a village in one hour. Undoubtedly, he is the one who devours the red-eyed dragons. All members of the squad realized that they were in a hopeless situation. There is no way they can defeat such a creature. The warriors fled. Noish turned to the running guys, urging them to stop. Douglas also ordered them to stand because the demonic black dragon tends to attack those who escape first. Immediately, a demonic black dragon attacked the squad. After the powerful attack, Douglas asked Ravi if she was okay. Then he saw the leader, a bearded man, who was examining his guys and asking if they were safe. Douglas, holding the girl in his arms, said that everything was normal. The bearded man ordered everyone to retreat and advised them to forget about their luggage. They don't have time to chat, he will be bait for the dragon, let the rest run. Douglas tried to dissuade the leader from this ridiculous act. But he replied that it was impossible to overtake the dragon on foot, especially with such wounds. Douglas thought that he would never send this man to certain death. 
he ordered Ravi to hold on tight and called on the magic to flare up in full force. Douglas used explosive acceleration. Noish, who was watching this, was surprised. This man had the ability to accelerate magic. In fact, he was a magician of an incomprehensible level. When Douglas caught up with the leader, he realized that the black dragon was preparing a fire attack. He shouted to the bearded man to just jump to the side and do it quickly. Douglas advised him to keep his eyes on his prey. He was reciting a fire magic spell. Ford used upward flight magic. Once he was in front of the dragon, he realized he needed to aim for the weak spot on its throat, the scales underneath. However, he understood that this area was very close to them, and if they stayed here, he and Ravi would also be affected. Douglas noticed how Noish rushed to the bearded man's aid and began to help him get up. The leader called him a bad boy and told him that he kept wondering, did he rely on him all the time he was part of the self-defense? Noish replied that this was not true at all. Seeing them, the old men in action, the desire to act burned within him too. Does he think he always wanted to be the one to save him? Douglas looked at them in surprise. Meanwhile, the dragon straightened up, spread its black wings and prepared to attack. Noosh turned to Douglas and asked him to give it his all. Ravi whispered in his ear so that dad would give it his all. Douglas Ford shouted for everyone to leave this dragon to him. When the black dragon attacked with fire, Douglas used wind magic to try to dispel the flames. In addition, he employed the use of multiple skills at the same time. It was ice magic, hell. His efforts were not in vain. The black dragon fell to the ground, being exposed to fire and ice at the same time. When it was all over, the bearded man fell to his knees in front of Douglas and asked for forgiveness. He said that if he had believed his words, he would not have put everyone in danger. He is truly sorry. Douglas calmed him down and said everything was fine. He shouldn't bow his head to him. His subordinates turned to him too and asked him to raise his head because no one was hurt. Then Douglas remembered that the leader had been wounded in the leg and asked him to show the wound. He wanted to use his skill to help. Noish asked the leader to get up and show his leg to the doctor. If he can't get up, he'll lend him his shoulder again. Then the squad separated the things of Noish and the leader. Douglas approached the huge dragon carcass and said that they needed to hurry up and return to the city. They must also report this demonic black dragon to the mayor's office. The party members asked him, but what will they do with this dragon? Noosh said they couldn't just leave it here, and on the other hand, they couldn't cut it apart with their current equipment. Douglas volunteered to help with this. He said that the dragon's center of gravity is centered on its belly. By holding it with wind magic, you can lift it. Everyone exclaimed in surprise as the dragon's carcass hung in the air. All members of the squad were in incredible amazement. They asked Noisha who this man was. He replied that he didn't know, but he was the strongest. Douglas thought ironically that he was the strongest adventurer with a child. It has been two days since Douglas Ford and Ravi left the town of Addington. Their journey south continued. His goal was the city of pleasures Milton. Moving towards Milton, the travelers came across a small river. Douglas asked the girl if she liked fish. Ravi replied that she loved fish very much, and then Douglas invited her to fish a little and cook dinner. Ravi expressed surprise, how would they fish without any gear? Douglas replied that he can use his skills, but today he thinks that Ravi will help him. The girl happily agreed. Ravi wondered with interest what awaits her next. Douglas gathered all the necessary materials, chocolate ivy, a jute bag and three branches, which Ravi collected and brought. The first thing Douglas did was tie dry branches to a branch that would serve as a pole, and then, making a hole in a jute bag, attached it to the pole. Thus, a fishing net was created. After that, Douglas went into the river with a net and asked Ravi to catch fish at him. The girl asked Ford how she could do this. He replied that she could do it her way, however she wanted. He'll dry her clothes afterwards anyway, so don't let her hold back. The girl understood everything, went into the water and began splashing loudly, thus directing the fish towards Douglas. The former adventurer was touched by Ravi's desire to complete his job. At first she did poorly, but with the help of Douglas's tips, the girl finally got the hang of it. Ford laughed happily at Ravi's efforts. Douglas pulled the net out of the water, and Ravi raised her hands in the air with a joyful cry. There was a big fish in the homemade fishing device. Douglas lit a fire on the riverbank and, stringing fish on branches, fried it. Ravi enjoyed trying the fish cooked over the fire and was very pleased with its taste. Douglas warned her that the bones were dangerous and therefore she should be careful with them. He explained that he added a little salt as a seasoning, and this season's silver cherry trout is very clean and soft, and its meat is loose and tender. Douglas praised Ravi and said that they did a very good job today. The wood in the fire suddenly crackled loudly, and Douglas said that he thought it would rain today. The girl asked if Dad really understood this too thanks to his magical ability. 
to which Douglas replied that he simply knows how to read the weather. Ravi was very surprised, she could not understand what the phrase means read the weather. Douglas took her hand and told her to look up at the sky. He showed the girl high, thick clouds called cumulonimbus clouds. He explained that heavy rain falls from these clouds. In addition, apparently, there was previously more water in the river than there is now. But it's probably too early for a sudden change in weather. As soon as he said this, it started to drop from the sky. Douglas picked the girl up in his arms, putting the hood of his coat over her head. He asked her to be patient for a while. Ford was glad he bought her a coat. However, the nearest town was still at least half a day away. Douglas thought that he needed to find some place where they could rest for a while, otherwise the girl might get sick. The rain intensified and poured like buckets. Ahead they saw a cart drawn by two horses, which a man tried unsuccessfully to push. There was a child sitting in the carriage. Douglas thought it must be the wagon that got stuck in the mud. He asked the stranger if there was anything he could do to help him. Suddenly, in the hands of this man was a bow equipped with an arrow. He said he would not accept help from the person and asked them to leave. Douglas realized with surprise that in front of them was an elf father and his child. Douglas has heard of elves who never leave the forest in which they were born. It's rare to meet someone in such a place. They are a different race and extremely careful. They seem arrogant towards the person. Although now nothing like that could be said, Douglas apologized and in a calm voice asked for forgiveness for scaring them, he was just passing by. He once again offered to help the elf. Calming the archer, Douglas said that he also does this when he is worried. Besides, he is also with a child and the elf can count on him. The elf lowered his bow and thanked Douglas in confusion. He said that the loaded luggage was quite heavy, so the two of them would not be able to lift it. Douglas asked the elf and the child to move back a little. The elf child anxiously asked his father if he could trust this man. He asked him to be polite and Douglas called on magic. The magical strengthening of muscles and muscle strength happened quickly. Douglas' body was filled with incredible strength. He pushed the cart vigorously and easily moved it from its place. The elf and his son were very surprised, they could not believe the incredible strength of this man. The elf sincerely thanked him and said that he was their savior. Douglas asked not to worry about it, he was glad that he could help. The elf once again apologized for his rudeness and said that his name was Louis and his son was Nicky. The elf stated that he would like to somehow express his gratitude, but he does not have enough goods. He invited Douglas to visit his village so that he and Ravi could take shelter from the rain. The former adventurer thanked the elf for the invitation and asked if he was sure that they could stay with him. Louis replied that of course he would provide them with shelter. Elves are very careful, but this does not mean that they are ungrateful. Douglas gratefully accepted his offer. Nikki said to Ravi that the children were sitting in the back and she would go with him. At the same time, he offered her his hand to help her climb into the carriage. However, the girl, blushing, pulled her hand away with force and pressed herself against Douglas. Nikki apologized and said that he was just thinking of giving a hand, that's all. Louis noticed that Douglas had a very cute daughter. Soon the cart set off. The children sat in the back inside the van and the men were in front on the beam. Nikki and Ravi introduced themselves to each other and the elf's son told the girl that her father was simply amazing. Douglas thought he and Ravi weren't very good at talking. However, she seemed lonely at the orphanage, so perhaps she is still shy of children her age. He is also not socialized, so he understands her difficulties. However, her own character is also affected, so this is a very complex issue. Anyway, it would be nice if Ravi made some friends. At this time, Louis announced that they had arrived at the place. It was a real elven village. Louis said that this is the lush green elven village of Floria. The houses here were located high in the trees. Ravi, seeing all this, was delighted. Douglas and Ravi soon found themselves at Louis's house. They dried out a little, and the elf's wife came out to them. She told them that her husband had told her about them. The elf thanked Douglas for the help provided during the rain on the road. She said that they could sleep in the same room. Let them feel free to stay overnight to wait out this heavy rain. Louis's wife offered them dry clothes, but Douglas objected and said that their clothes would soon dry. After that he called upon wind magic to make their clothes dry faster. The elf's wife insisted that they stay the night, as a fellow guardian should not be modest. Douglas had nothing more to object to her, and he agreed to stay in their house. Then he asked if there was anything he could do to help. Soon the owners invited the guests to the table. Louis asked Douglas matter-of-factly, does this mean they have a long journey ahead of them to Baltzac? He explained that they rarely leave this village. The exception is shopping trips, so it never occurred to them to go on a trip. There are many dangers everywhere, and it seems that there have been more monsters lately. Nikki asked Douglas if he had ever seen a mermaid. The former adventurer replied that he had seen her. 
He said that in the southern seas there was a pirate fleet led by mermaids. He fought against them when he supported one country's fleet there. Although they were enemies, their singing fascinated him. However, they flinched when he tried to sing back to them. Mickey was delighted and asked if he really fought them. What about dragons? Douglas replied that he had only recently come across them. The elf's son was not far behind. He asked Ravi if maybe she had seen them too. The girl nodded in response and Mickey jumped for joy. Mickey never ceased to rejoice, his questions poured in as if from a cornucopia. Louis was forced to reason with him, he asked his son to sit down. Then the elf turned to Douglas and said that thanks to him, he had gained very valuable experience today. This is his first time interacting with someone of a different race. Perhaps they, the elves, are at a loss because of life in their little world. Louis asked Douglas what he thought about the elves not opening their hearts to other races. Ford didn't know what to answer, he was bad at such conversations. Suddenly, Mickey summoned the spirit of light, giving the power to illuminate the darkness. It was the magic of light, radiance. Ravi looked fascinated at the manifestation of magic. Douglas knew that elves specialized in magical skills for everyday work, but to learn at such a young age, Ravi asked him if she could practice this too. Douglas realized that the girl wanted to learn some magic skills. Mickey asked Ravi if she wanted him to teach her. If so, then he has no other choice and will have to teach her personally. He asked Ravi to memorize the spell he had just used and then concentrate the energy of his body in his palms as if he were squeezing them tightly. Then he asked to chant the spell of the Spirit of Light once with him. The girl repeated everything after Nikki, reciting the spell of light magic, radiance. However, nothing happened. The girl said in confusion that she couldn't and that nothing was working for her. Douglas stood up from his seat and told Ravi that she would not be able to learn this magic so quickly. However, Louis put his index finger to his lips in warning. Nikki said that even it took him a whole month. However, if Ravi really wanted to learn, then he would take care of her training while she was here. Douglas reflected that he too had a hard time at first because he didn't have the knowledge of how to learn his first skill. However, he is a bad teacher, so maybe Nikki will do better than him. Douglas thought absentmindedly about why Ravi suddenly wanted to learn skills. Nikki turned to the girl and said that since they were here, she had a predisposition to skills. He suggested asking Grandpa to check it out. Ravi asked in surprise, what is predisposition? Nikki, in turn, was also surprised that she didn't know about it. Your ability or inability to use skills depends primarily on the talent you are born with. If there is no predisposition, everything will be useless, no matter how much it is practiced. Mike said that wouldn't it be better to find out now than to cry later. He asked the grandfather to check if this girl had a predisposition for any skills. Grandfather looked at the girl carefully. Douglas also watched this action with excitement. This could have been a disaster. What Nike said is more or less true. The potential for skills is determined at birth and never changes throughout life. If the old man does this and says that she has no ability, it will be a huge blow to Ravi's psyche. The old man, looking at the girl, chuckled vaguely. He said she might have some abilities. Ravi approached Douglas and stated that she was eager to learn the skills. Ford replied that he knew that. Mickey asked Douglas why not show the girl a skill or two as an example. Grandfather added that in the end, it is better to learn skills by observing and feeling, rather than just guessing in your head. Douglas was forced to admit that they were definitely right. Douglas asked Ravi to watch the actions carefully. After that, he summoned the magic of light, radiance. At the last moment, Douglas realized that he had miscalculated the amount of energy. The radiance in the room reached such a limit that everyone was almost blinded. It was simply amazing. Everyone was simply delighted with the heavenly light. Grandfather even thought it was morning. Douglas apologized to everyone for his mistake. Louis exclaimed that he had never seen such a bright glow from a simple light skill. Who is he? Douglas replied that he was just a little off with the energy. A bright light and radiance blazed over the elf village for a long time. Douglas asked Louis in excitement if the villagers had been harmed by the lightning unwittingly caused by his spell. It seemed to him as if the trees had collapsed. Is everything okay here? The elf replied that it was very loud and he hoped that lightning did not fall on someone's house. Douglas asked if there were really any lightning rods in this village. Louis replied that they do not use things that require the skill of other races. They also hold a festival at the beginning of every spring to ward off lightning. Douglas nodded understandingly, he had heard about these elven customs. He understood that it was not for him, an outsider, to interfere in their lives. Suddenly, someone knocked loudly on the door of the room, and the voice of a villager told Louis that he brought bad news. One of the villagers reported that lightning caused a fire in Moro's house. Despite their efforts to put it out, the fire grows out of control. At this rate, the entire area will soon go up in flames. Douglas Ford realized that he could not sit idly by. 
he stated that he would go outside to help in some way. Ravi wanted to go with him, and Douglas agreed with her. Ford said that he would go first, and they would have to jump down from the house. He took Ravi in his arms, and after reciting the spell, jumped down. The magic of upward flight helped him, and the girl land safely. The elves needed help. One of the villagers asked Douglas to save his wife and child, who were buried under the rubble of a building. Douglas noticed the raging flames around him. The elves were in a panic, they declared that at this rate their forest would burn to the ground. It's unavoidable. We need to cut down all the big trees in the area as soon as possible. Someone asked, what about the Moro family? They just can't get out on their own. Douglas asked the elves to disperse, he can put out the fire. The villagers were surprised and outraged why a man appeared in this forest. Meanwhile, Douglas summoned the Holy Spirit of Water and asked him to grant him his blessed water. Water magic, the undying caused an incredible rainfall. A whole waterfall of blessed water fell from heaven to earth. The villagers were happy to see that almost all the flames had gone out. Douglas turned to the elves and said that he knew that they were a very cautious race. If they don't want to see them in this forest, they can leave now. However, extinguishing this flame comes first for him. He wants to save those who are suffering. After these words, the elder raised his hand and called on all the elves to listen to him. He said he understood everyone's outrage. However, now we need to work together with this person. Let them not forget what they should do first. At this time, Louis and his wife joined Douglas. The woman asked Ravi if she was okay. The girl replied that she was fine and clung to her father. After that, she asked Douglas to be careful. Ford replied that she could rely on him. Then he began to sort out the rubble and, throwing a huge stone aside, called someone else to him. Several male elves came to his aid, but were unable to move the huge tree trunk that was preventing him from reaching the victims. Douglas realized the futility of their efforts and asked everyone to step aside and leave it to him. The elves asked how he was going to do it alone. Instead of answering, Douglas again turned to magic. He again used muscle strengthening and muscle strength, after which he easily threw the tree trunk aside. The elves were very surprised and thought that this man was some kind of monster. After that, they all began to clear the rubble together. They soon identified victims who had horrific wounds. Someone ordered to call a doctor immediately. However, Douglas stopped him and said that this should not be done. He again turned to magic and began treatment. Magic, complete restoration brought the victims back to life. Douglas said their wounds must now heal. Finally, the woman and child, trapped under the rubble, began to move. The women exclaimed that this was a great relief. Her husband hugged her and her son. After several hours of hard work, the flames were extinguished. One could breathe a sigh of relief. However, Douglas and Ravi, who were not supposed to be in the elf village, caused unnecessary fuss. Douglas felt very sorry for Louis and the others, but now they had to go to the next city. At this time, someone called out to him and asked him to wait. Douglas looked back and saw the villagers kneeling. They thanked Douglas for saving them. They regretted treating them with contempt. Moreau said that if they had not been here, his wife and daughter would not have survived. Douglas asked them not to worry about it, they should not bow their heads to him. The next day the weather was beautiful and clear. However, it appears that the damage from last night's events has been enormous. Douglas turned to Louis and said that they would leave as soon as they could help them settle everything. He asked if he would cause trouble if he helped them. The elf replied that this was impossible. Everyone will be delighted. Ford was glad to hear this. He asked Ravi what she planned to do before evening. At this time, Mickey said that if Ravi goes, then he also wants to go. He can also help in the village. Louis thanked him for the offer, but noted that it wasn't something the kids could help with. Nikki annoyedly asked why he was treating him like a child. Then Ravi said that she wants to stay here. Douglas was fine with that because Nikki would stay home too. It's probably much more fun to be with other children than to be alone with adults. After that he went to the village. The village was in full swing with work, cleaning up the aftermath of a night fire. Douglas was surprised that all the residents called him Muscle San. They thanked him for yesterday and expressed their gratitude in different ways. Douglas asked them not to worry because he came to help further. The elves gladly accepted his help and said that he was truly a kind person. Douglas thanked the villagers and said that he was glad for the kind words, but his name was not Muscle San. The elves happily said that they would show him their spirit. With extraordinary enthusiasm they began to roll over huge trunks of broken trees. Douglas was surprised to notice that the elves had become much stronger, he asked Louis, is this not a magical muscle strengthening buff? The elf replied that they seemed to have more power than usual when they imitated Douglas. They admire him, Douglas asked in surprise whether they really admire him. Louis noticed that after all, elves are a weak race. Nothing can be done about their envy of his developed muscles. By the end of the day, it was time to clean up the entire area, 
and the elves happily took on the job, deciding to do everything in their power. The bell rang in the bell tower, signaling the end of work. Soon everyone returned to the house. Douglas only noticed halfway through that they hadn't finished yet. It doesn't seem like there are elves in this forest who own the muscle-strengthening buff, but he still wants to somehow deal with that big fallen tree. At Louis's house, Ravi was eagerly waiting for him. Mickey told Douglas that Ravi had been practicing skills with him non-stop, and he had acted like a teacher, providing intensive training. Douglas asked about their progress, and the girl said that she was still not succeeding. Ford noticed that Ravi was a little upset, Douglas asked her if something happened. Ford thought with concern that Ravi always smiled when she was happy. What's wrong with her smile now? It's like she's forcing herself to smile. Come to think of it, her cheeks are a lot redder than usual. He decided to take a look at her status. Douglas put his hand to the girl's head and called upon the magic of wisdom, judge. Ravi's condition was assessed as fatigue and cold. Douglas asked the girl how she could catch a cold and also be tired. Nikki exclaimed in surprise that she was incredibly energetic. He apologized to Ravi and said that he would now call the doctor, but for now she should rest a little. The girl was put into bed and Douglas sat at her head. Douglas noticed that the girl's body was surprisingly hot. He should have noticed this earlier. The full recovery skill only works on physical injuries, so it is not suitable for treating illnesses. Since fatigue is listed as a status illness, she must have persisted in practicing the skills. Thus, she exhausted herself. Why did she go so far? He mentally asked Ravi for forgiveness. Douglas thought with irritation that he continued to cause trouble for some. Since the battle with the dragon, Ravi seemed to hear his thoughts and said that she wanted to be with him. Dad took her with him wherever he went, Mr. Bimf, bearded man, and everyone else got angry at them. Douglas realized that the girl was delirious and remembered the words of the bearded man, who reproached him for taking on the task with the child. Then a phrase from Noish came to his mind, asking him if he thought he was the same girl. At this time, Ravi said to Douglas that she was just a burden who was not capable of anything. She wants to learn magic so she won't cause trouble, and although she is with him, she is still in great pain. Now Douglas understood why Ravi was desperate to learn the skills. He said he never considered her a burden. Douglas noted bitterly that Ravi had a chill. He thought that no matter what he said, Ravi would not be able to forgive himself. Even this morning she was like that. During their conversation, once she heard from Louis that this was not something the kids could help with, Ravi decided to stay home. Then he thought that the girl just wanted to stay with Nikki, but it seems that he was mistaken. Though wanting to take her with him to protect him probably wasn't a good idea either. After all, because he got her into all kinds of trouble, he made her worry. Raising a child is not easy. In that case, how about every time they find themselves in a dangerous situation, he will consider the girl's independent action. He won't make the decision himself. They will discuss together which course of action is best. He invited Ravi to think and act together. The girl agreed, but said that she would still try to stop being a burden as soon as possible. Douglas turned to Ravi and said that she wasn't a burden or anything but he still understood her feelings. However, she must control herself. Don't let her make him worry so much anymore. The girl smiled and asked for forgiveness. Just then Louis returned and said that the doctor would be here soon. Douglas then asked Ravi if she wanted to eat. He will try to cook as best as possible, just let her tell him. The girl was delighted and said that she wanted her father's soup. The soup she ate the day they first met. Douglas promised to do it right away. After that, he went to the kitchen where he was met by Louis' wife. She asked him to take the little rabbits to the girl, which she had prepared especially for her. He asked the woman how she cut them like that. Could she teach him? He was sure Ravi would like it. Louis's wife threw up her hands and said that he was a really good father because he immediately noticed a change in his daughter's health. Taking on the responsibilities of both father and mother is not so easy to cope with. Douglas said he still makes mistakes, so he continues to reflect. The woman replied that this also applied to them. Raising children is difficult. However, this is much more important than anything else. Ford admitted that she was definitely right. Douglas took the dish prepared by Louis's wife to Ravi. When he returned to the girl's room, he saw that she was still hungry. Ford told the girl that he had apples for her. The prettier ones were cut by Louis's wife. Ravi was delighted, she loved rabbits very much. She stated that she liked the rabbits that were closest to Douglas in the plate. He got embarrassed and said that he didn't cut these very well. However, Ravi insisted that she liked these better. Douglas looked at her smile and looked into her eyes. Now Ravi was happy. Douglas and Ravi took advantage of the goodwill of Louis and the other elves, who allowed them to stay here until the girl's fever passed. Meanwhile, the forest clearing work was completed. On the day when they were about to set off further, the elf grandfather decided to look at Ravi's abilities. 
he put his hand to the girl's head and said what he saw. Her strength. He told her not to worry. She certainly has a predisposition for skill. However, it seems that her power lies dormant somewhere deep. She will need a stimulus to awaken her. Grandfather assured that everything would be fine. If a child's heart seeks her, he is sure that she will answer her and one day awaken. He explained that her skill potential is 5 in 120. It was simply amazing. It was known that the average potential of a person who can use skills is 3,000. In the absence of any predisposition, this value would be zero, whereas the higher this potential, the easier it is to master complex skills. Ravi asked Douglas what its meaning was. He replied that it was exactly 900. Louis was surprised. Can it really be so little? With so many, you can only use a few basic skills intended for everyday use. Douglas agreed with this statement, and Grandfather decided to look at him. After some manipulation, the Grandfather stated that, as this man had claimed, his potential was indeed 900. Louis asked in surprise then, how could he use such powerful skills? Grandfather replied that he put an unimaginable amount of effort into this. He said to Douglas that he admired the life he had led so far. Ford looked at the old man gratefully. When Douglas and Ravi said goodbye, Nikki seemed very upset. Douglas thanked the elves for everything, and the boy asked if they were really leaving. Douglas once again thanked the dear elves for the shelter they provided. Nikki looked at Ravi and said that she still hasn't learned any skills, and she might catch a cold again. They can just stay here. Then the child could not stand it and cried, he said that he really liked Ravi. And he wants to always be with her, he wants her to become his bride. There was a noise among the elves, and Douglas thought that he was probably the only one who had not noticed it. Ravi looked at Nikki in surprise and said that she liked her dad. There was laughter from the crowd of elves. She loves her daddy. They also all loved their dads when they were little, especially such an attractive daddy. Douglas finally came to his senses and said, turning to Nikki, that this was out of the question now. He thought that the boy had pure and sincere love for her. Although he may be her adoptive father and such things are extremely pleasant, they are still inconvenient to perceive. If he were her real father, perhaps he would be more in genuine awe. At this time, Louis patted his son on the head and asked if Nikki had really rejected him. He turned to Douglas and asked him not to pay attention to his child. They say boys grow up with a broken heart. After that, he handed over the gifts that were collected in the village for them. Douglas thanked Louis from the bottom of his heart and apologized for the trouble he had caused. Douglas said that they must now set out. It wasn't long, but it was fun. After that, they once again said goodbye to the villagers and walked energetically towards Milton. They were followed by cheers of joy. Douglas and Ravi looked back one last time and walked away. All the villagers had already gone home, but Nikki was still standing on the outskirts of the village and looking after the people. Louis asked him how long he was going to stay like this. The little elf replied that he would leave this village as soon as he became an adult. He told his father that this Mr. told him about many things that can only be found in books. He wants to see them with his own eyes. He also wants to learn many skills and travel. Then tears appeared in his eyes, and he added that he wanted to see Ravi one more time. Louis put his hand on his son's head and said that he was sure that he would succeed because he was very proud of him. Walking along the narrow path among the green grass, Douglas thought that the elven village of Floria had received them very well. He is very happy. This is the most cozy village he has ever been to. At this time, he noticed the gift that Louis gave him during his farewell. There was a letter there. Douglas unfolded it and read it. Louis wrote it. He thanked him sincerely for these last few days. He decided to take a positive approach to the issue of installing lightning rods in the village. Since they do not have the technology, they will decide to install them by sending a request to people. Most likely, they would rarely meet good people like him, but still he convinced him to think about trying to compromise. He reported that it was all thanks to Douglas. At the end, he expressed hope that he would have a wonderful trip. At this time, Ravi tugged at Douglas's arm. Ravi pointed to the sky and said there was a rabbit there. The girl mistook the bizarre cloud for the figure of an animal. Douglas thought that they would really have a wonderful trip. He took Ravi's hand and mentally wished Louis wonderful encounters wherever he went. Douglas and Ravi were lucky enough to catch a passing passenger stagecoach along the way. The girl watched the horses with joy, and Douglas thought that in the past he had once ridden in a horse-drawn carriage, albeit on a baggage flight. It had been half a day since they left Floria. To sell the necklace that was the catalyst for Ravi's curse, they traveled to the pleasure city of Milton, where a collector of cursed items named Baron Morse resided. The journey to Milton takes several days, as this stagecoach stops at several towns and villages along the way. From there, it's a ten-day walk to Baldsack. In other words, all his time with Ravi on this journey will not last long, and Douglas wanted to show Ravi as much of this wonderful world as possible. 
Suddenly, Douglas heard a fragment of a conversation between two passengers sitting not far from him. They discussed the news about Alan's hero group. From the statement of one of the passengers it followed that Alan and his people left Baltzac. However, the second claimed that not only were they still in Baltzac, but they were also recruiting new members to the team to pacify the Demon King. Douglas felt extraordinary excitement. He heard the news about Alan. Douglas thought that he had already left Baltzac for several months, they were still staying in the city. And what does it mean that Alan is recruiting new members? Sage Edmund always advocated for the minimum possible composition of the group. It's hard to believe that they are simply increasing their numbers, or maybe someone else left the group. Douglas turned to the passengers and asked if they could tell him more about this. Fellow travelers thought that this man was a fan of Alan's hero. However, they could not add anything to what had already been said, because nothing more was known. Douglas nodded his head in understanding, and one of the passengers in the back seat asked him how much he was willing to pay for information about the heroes. Out of surprise, Douglas asked the girl to repeat it again. She willingly agreed to do this and asked because he wants to know about the hero. Until recently she was a seamstress at Baltzac, so she is quite knowledgeable. She stated that Douglas seemed poor and she was willing to give him a discount. Douglas thought that this girl did not look like a decent person. However, even though a lot had happened, it would have been difficult if he had said that he was not interested in his former comrades. The man's fellow travelers warned Douglas that if he did not want to be deceived, then he should not get involved with this girl. She posed as a magician from Milton to some people who had come out earlier, encouraging them to buy counterfeit goods. The girl angrily shouted at them to refrain from making false accusations. However, the men said that they had been sitting opposite her all this time, and if she caused trouble, they would be forced to hand her over to the military police. The girl called them idiots and turned away. Douglas patted Ravi on the head and expressed his gratitude to the men for the warning. The girl laughed and asked Douglas if he was trying to be a good guy. The former adventurer replied that that was not the point. He just thought that even though she was now a magician from Milton, she used to be a seamstress at Baltzac. This is completely obvious. Passengers said that no one would believe that a seamstress was changing her job to a magician. The girl replied that she had no desire to chat with them after her secret was revealed. Douglas thought that since he was not there, it means that he could not determine which of them was right. After this, the girl did not say a word, and the stagecoach continued on its way. Five days later, in the morning they arrived in the city. Ravi marveled that the town of Milton was so huge, they finally arrived in this city of pleasures, he was even bigger than Addington. The city was divided into three large areas, the old city they were now in, District 16, an upper-class district, which is located on the right bank of the Laura River, as well as Bacchus Lanes, which connect these two areas together. They first went to District 16, where Baron Morse lived, but he had been away since he went on a short trip. They were told that the Baron would return in five days. They were out of luck with this. Douglas turned to Ravi for advice and asked her what they would do with the necklace. If it's bearable, he doesn't mind waiting five days. The girl agreed with him. They decided to visit Morse again. After all, Douglas didn't know anyone who could buy the dark accessory from them. Ravi, after thinking, said that maybe this is so, but it's fun to travel with Dad, so she doesn't mind if they stay together for a long time. Douglas thought that if this journey was delayed, the costs would also increase. Shouldn't they quickly go to the city where she would settle permanently? However, what does she think? He picked the girl up in his arms and said that in that case they would rest here for a while. It's a big city, so he's sure they'll be able to try a wide variety of sweets. Suddenly he heard a sharp conversation in the shadow of a house. Douglas thought that it seemed that these Bacchus lanes weren't particularly civilized. He told Ravi that he was going to check what happened there and asked her to find a place where she could hide nearby. He went in the direction where the swearing was coming from and saw several people standing in front of the man who had knelt down. One of the bandits ordered him to hurry up and bring the girl. They advised the old man on his knees to fulfill their simple request because it had nothing to do with him. The man replied that he could not do this. It is his duty to protect Princess Rose. Then the bandit raised his baton and said that apparently he was asking for even more pain. At this time, Douglas ordered the bandit to stop. He told these people that they should have seen this man was injured. Douglas said that he had no idea what happened here, but attacking one with a whole group was clearly overkill. The chief of the bandits asked him, clinging to his clothes, what was wrong with him. He advised Douglas to mind his own business. He intends to beat the crap out of him too, this piece of trash. However, Douglas grabbed the bandit's wrist and rendered him unable to move. The robber was amazed at the monstrous strength of this man. From the way the leader was called by his accomplices, Douglas realized that his name was Carlos. Carlos, wincing in pain, asked Douglas to let him go. Once free, he ordered his men to leave. 
After this, Douglas turned to the wounded old man. Finally, the bandit threatened Douglas and told him not to forget his eyes. Douglas turned to Ravi, who was peeking around the corner, and said that everything was all right now. Then he asked how the old man was feeling and saw that his leg was broken. He ordered him not to move. Then, using a spell of complete restoration, he healed the leg of the wounded old man. He was very surprised and said that it didn't hurt anymore. Douglas explained to him that it was because he healed her with a skill, but for some time it will still be difficult to move your leg. This is a feature of healing skills. There is a delay before the mind realizes that the body is healed. When he tried to get up, the old man fell onto the sidewalk again. Douglas said he should have been given a cane, but he could walk him home if he held on to it. The old man noticed that he was a very good person and Ford advised him not to worry about this. After that, the old man leaned on Douglas's shoulder and they set off. So they hobbled towards Macy's red light district. The old man said that the brothel where he works is located just outside the gates of a large building. To Douglas's surprised look, he replied that he was an employee of a brothel. The former adventurer did not know what to do. Bringing Ravi to a brothel was somehow out of the question. However, it doesn't matter because it's only noon. Surely this place is closed right now. Douglas made up his mind and led the old man further. They entered a luxurious room, furnished in good taste. Douglas thought that it was very quiet here. He didn't expect this at all. The old man explained that this was an annex behind the main building, and that at this hour everyone was still sleeping. As Douglas sat the old man down on a chair, he thought that it seemed like he was being overly cautious. But still, if they stay here for a long time, this place may have a bad influence on Ravi. As soon as he imprisons the old man, he will have to leave here quickly. At this time, Madam came down the stairs. She turned to the old man, whose name was Ted, and worriedly asked what happened to him. Ted pointed at Douglas and said that the man protected him from Carlos and the others. They got scared and ran away, although he didn't even hit them. Madam looked at Douglas and said that he was good, even with a child. Ford told her not to worry about it, it was time for them to go. Madam replied indignantly that she could not let him go so easily. She invited them to the table and said that she would now prepare a cake for them. Ravi was delighted. Then they sat with Douglas at the table and ate cake, drinking tea. Behind them stood a large crowd of girls from the brothel, who watched them with pleasure. They showed admiration for Ravi's beauty, noting her fair skin and silky hair. They wondered how old she was. In addition, they had already heard that Douglas drove away Carlos and the rest of the bandits alone. The girls from the brothel were too frank about everything. Madam looked at Douglas with respect and told him that he just saved them anyway. These scumbags have been infatuated with their best girl lately. They make their life difficult, and they are, frankly, at a loss. Madam cautiously asked him why not become a bodyguard in her establishment. Douglas was surprised, and Madam said that it was only for five days and, of course, he would be generously paid for this work. She explained that there are some circumstances surrounding this, but once everything is settled, these guys will not be able to cause any more trouble. Douglas found the offer tempting. They planned to spend five days here with Ravi, but he replied that he was very sorry because they were traveling and besides, he was with a child. The girls began to beg him. If it's his daughter, they won't look after her here. Many of them also have plenty of children. Douglas understood their concerns. If he were alone, he would no doubt help them. However, even if it's just for a few days, Ravi might see something she shouldn't see in the brothel. He turned to Madam and said that he was very sorry, but he still could not accept her offer. Madam said that it was her fault because she was asking for something excessive. She added without any hope that they had somehow managed it so far, and she was sure that this time they would come up with something. Douglas and Ravi left the establishment and stayed at a hotel. The girl looked sad and asked her dad if he wasn't going to help these people. Douglas saw tears appear on her face. Ford tried to calm the girl down and asked her not to cry. However, he understood that Ravi was angry with him. Angry because he didn't help the people in the brothels. He realizes that he acted heartlessly. Perhaps he felt disappointed. Of course he could explain why. However, can he answer the girl frankly that he does not want to let her near the brothel? This is the world of adults overcome by lust. A brothel and prostitution are completely vicious concepts. Explaining this to a child is not the same as taking Ravi to a brothel. In that case, should he hide the existence of the brothel and come up with some explanation for why he didn't help? If possible, he just wants Ravi to see beautiful things. Isn't it great that she doesn't know anything about the adult world? Ravi is still a child, she will cry because she cannot control her emotions. Douglas wondered if he could say why he refused to help these people. He asked Ravi about it, and she said she could. Douglas felt that he still could not tell the truth. Lying to suit the situation is another dirty, undesirable trait of adults. 
How should a parent behave? Since he and Ravi are not related by blood, maybe he should give in a little. Oh no, this is the only thing he doesn't want to apologize for. These words will trample his connection with Ravi. He heard the girl address him. Ravi asked if there were people he didn't want to help. Douglas replied that this was not the case at all. Then the girl wanted to know why he didn't help in this case. He replied that the place where they went today was called a brothel. Had she ever heard this word? Ravi replied that she was hearing it for the first time. Douglas said that a brothel is a place where men have lost money. Then he got confused and said that this is not what he wants to say. He decided to explain Ravi differently. He asked her to assume that she had someone she liked and they became lovers. This is when she is hugged by someone who is not indifferent to her. When she can feel relief and happiness. Ravi, looking into Douglas's eyes, replied that she feels happy when her dad hugs her tightly. Ford answered, confused, that it was a little different. It doesn't matter though. He continued to explain to the girl that this is an opportunity to have physical contact with someone who reciprocates. This is wonderful, but there are those who are not lucky enough to meet such a person to fill this loneliness, pay women to be affectionate with them. That's what a brothel is. Ravi asked Douglas if using money to get affection is bad. He replied that how much loneliness and sadness they carry within themselves is known only to themselves. Therefore, it would be wrong to talk about this as something bad. He just thinks that it's still quite sad to buy love with money. So he just thought that he didn't want to let her near such a place. The girl asked him, so this is the reason why he refused to help them. She asked for forgiveness and said that even though he had good intentions, she didn't understand it at all. She also understands how to be sadly alone. After all, she too was sad until she met her dad. Besides, she prefers a dad who helps everyone. Therefore, she would like him to help these unfortunate people. Douglas thought about it. Adults must guide children. He must have arbitrarily come to this conclusion in his thoughts. However, he even said that he would consult her whenever problems arose. What the hell is he doing? Douglas asked Ravi for forgiveness and promised to go to the brothel with her again tomorrow. When they arrived at the establishment, along the way they met many people who had been drinking alcohol all night and were now lying right on the sidewalk. I wonder what Ravi will think when he sees such adults. At this time, the girl noticed that the weather was beautiful outside. Douglas agreed with her and said that today would be a warm day. Looks like he was overthinking it all. Ravi is a girl who is able to notice the beauty in life with her own eyes. Douglas thought that he, too, should look at the world more broadly. To protect the people important to him without hurting him, he needs to be more tolerant. Approaching the brothel, they heard some noise. In front of the establishment, Douglas saw Carlos and his gang, who were demanding from Madame Princess Rose, with whom they allegedly had an affair. She ignored their big brother for some tramps. They advised Madame to hurry up and bring Princess Rose to them. Carlos said that this girl is already covered in scars. She doesn't want them to become even more cruel, does she? At this time, Rose appeared on the threshold and said that it was very noisy here. She repeated that they barked a lot like dogs. Carlos turned to her and declared that today she would definitely be his. Princess Rose replied that she had shown herself to him as he had asked. If he is now satisfied, why shouldn't he rush home? She called him a barking little fry as a boss. She doesn't have time to take care of some smelly puppies. If they had given a kind and tempting offer, there would have been at least some point in ignoring it. Carlos got angry and called the girl a fucking bitch. He intended to beat her. However, Douglas Ford intervened. He ordered him to stop the violence. The bandits, seeing Douglas, warned Carlos of the danger. After all, he himself told them that the hand that this guy grabbed last time still hurt. Carlos told them to shut up. He remembered that himself. He remembered so well that he retreated himself and took his assistance with him. Finally, he again threatened Douglas. Madam couldn't believe her eyes. This guy is back. Douglas picked up Ravi and apologized to Madam for showing up so late. He told her that he had changed his mind and would like to accept her offer for a job as a bodyguard. Ted worriedly asked Princess Rose if she was hurt. She replied that she was fine and walked over to Douglas Ford. She thanked him for saving her and asked what reward he expected from her. She added that she would do anything for him. Douglas looked very embarrassed. At this time, a girl with black hair and a shovel in her hands ran out of the establishment. She screamed that she intended to save Princess Rose. Douglas recognized her. Then she stumbled and fell on the sidewalk. The girl slowly looked around and asked where these scumbags had gone. The girl rose to her knees and fixed her gaze on Douglas. It was his fellow passenger from the stagecoach. She also recognized Ford and called him a hypocrite. Madame was surprised and asked the former adventurer if he really knew Veronica. Douglas didn't know what to answer, but Veronica said that they were still just at the dating stage. She then turned to Douglas and asked him to step away for a second. 
Veronica took Douglas and Ravi around the corner of the building and said that she would never forgive the two of them if they spilled the beans about what happened on the stagecoach. Ford asked her, apparently she didn't want the coincidence with the trip to become known. The girl shook her head impatiently and replied that she did not want anyone to know how she tried to deceive him. Either way, he must keep it a secret. So after all, she tried to deceive Douglas that time. The former adventurer sighed and asked her not to worry about it now. If she wants him not to mention it, then he won't do it. Besides, his visit here has a completely different reason. Veronica asked for evidence that Mr. Curing would never gossip about it. Because there is no one in the world who can be trusted only on the basis of his word. Douglas replied that she herself was asking him about it. Then Veronica offered him some money for silence. Then she suddenly pressed herself close to the man and whispered to him that he should come to her tonight, leaving the girl with someone. And if he wants, they can start right now. Douglas pushed the girl away and said that he was not going to preach to her, but seduction was not something children should do. Veronica asked indignantly, what part of her body does she look like a child? Douglas calmly looked at Veronica and declared that he would keep what happened in the carriage a secret. However, he doesn't need money. He cannot accept something like money just to exchange a promise. Veronica, weighing the bag of money in her hand, asked him if he was being a hypocrite again. Looking down on her, Douglas replied that this was not the case. If we are talking about money, it will no longer be a promise, but a contract. Either way, he would definitely keep his promise to her. The girl persisted. She said that she could not believe these words of his. She said the contract didn't sound that bad. Because he will never betray her with a paid contract. She told him to shut up and accept her money. Douglas thought that there were many examples of contracts involving money being broken by involving even more money. It's really useless to tell her about it now. Although, why does he go so far? At this time, Veronica threw a bag of money in front of Douglas at his feet and shouted at him that he was a stubborn old man. Suddenly, Madame approached them and asked Veronica what she was doing. The owner of the establishment looked at the money that was lying on the sidewalk and told Veronica that she was behaving like a child. Then Madame escorted Douglas and Ravi to the establishment where they met the embarrassed Princess Rose. Madame stated, pointing to Douglas, that this man was their important guest, whom they hired as a bodyguard. She asked not to disturb him too much. When the owner of the establishment seated the guests at the table to drink tea, she apologized for what happened on behalf of the headstrong girl named Veronica. Douglas assured her that everything was fine. Madame seemed pleased and asked Douglas if they could really rely on him as a guard. Ford confirmed this and apologized for yesterday. Madame asked not to apologize for this. She said men like him were quite rare. She then wished to explain the situation. She explained that the extravagant young man Carlos had taken a liking to their number one prostitute, Princess Rose, in the past. He visited Princess Rose every day in the hope of making her his, no matter what. He offered her any money if only she would become his property. Unfortunately, he is known for his mistreatment of prostitutes. They would never have allowed him to see her, and so, naturally, they refused. It was after this that he and his men began to harass them. Madame sighed heavily, clasped her fingers, and declared that this was the whole story. Douglas thought that it seemed like they had been putting up with this for a long time, and yet he was happy to help them. He asked the owner of the establishment if they were still bothering them. He wants to figure out a way to protect them based on this. Madame replied that the most dangerous time is at night, when they lure clients. At first they made noise around the establishment and outside the gates, and soon children appeared throwing garbage at them. Because of this, she had to patrol the area with her servant. As a result, as he knows, Ted suffered. Douglas asked why don't they stop bringing in customers from outside. The woman replied that, unfortunately, they could not. New girls are luring clients. Plus, if they don't find any clients, there's even a chance that they won't earn anything in a day. Moreover, communication with customers is an important point in order to make them regular customers. No matter how dangerous it is, they cannot avoid it. It became clear to Douglas that they not only attracted customers, but also wanted to be able to talk to them. But he can only protect the establishment for the next four days. Even if we manage to drive these thugs away, chances are that other guys like them will show up later. Douglas wanted to find a way for the girls to safely attract clientele, even after he left if possible. Suddenly, a handkerchief fell onto the table from the second floor balcony. Madame looked up and apologized. Ted was standing on the balcony. He also apologized and said that he accidentally dropped his handkerchief. He said he would pick it up right away. Madame reproachfully told him that she and Douglas were having a very important conversation. Suddenly a thought occurred to Douglas. He told the madam that if it was dangerous to attract clients from outside, then they could simply stay inside the brothel. They can attract people from the windows of a building. The owner of the establishment replied that it was of course safe. 
but in this case, if they were not loud enough, the guests would not stop to listen. Sexual attraction will also decrease, and they will not be able to establish long-distance contact. Douglas took a fallen scarf with embroidered flowers and asked, what about this? The former adventurer asked Madam, because establishing direct contact is not necessarily the only way to seduce, Madam's face showed understanding. She said then they should make them yearn for a flower on a high peak? This is exactly what you need. When the conversation with Madam was completed, Ravi handed Douglas a flower and said that she had picked it especially for him. He thanked her and they went to the room they had been given. Ravi saw a large number of outfits on the table. Ravi asked what he was going to do with so many dresses. Douglas picked up the scissors and, grinning, told the girl to just watch. Ravi carefully watched his father's work as he energetically cut up dresses with scissors. After that, he collected artificial flowers from fabric. He was good at it and Ravi really liked it. Douglas's idea was simple but ingenious. He invited the girls to throw artificial flowers down from the windows. After all, if something falls from above, it will be quite natural to raise your head to look at it. Otherwise you won't harm anyone, and they look great. Madam was very pleased and said it was a very well thought out idea. She asked Douglas, since they were making flowers, maybe she should go and wake up the girls. She and Ted are completely hopeless at sewing, but she is sure that these girls can somehow help. Douglas replied that this should not be done because girls always sleep at this time and there is no need to change their routine. Madam looked into the eyes of the former adventurer with delight and told him that he was truly a wonderful person. If necessary, they have a whole mountain of old clothes, so let him safely use it. Douglas approached Ravi and asked her to make more folds on the flower he had made earlier. Douglas wanted the artificial flowers to resemble the flower Ravi picked for him. He wanted Ravi to help him crumple the cloth. The girl beamed all over and promised that she would be happy to help her dad. By the end of the day, a huge pile of manufactured flowers appeared on the table in front of Ravi and Douglas. The girl was very happy that dad managed to sew a whole bunch of such beautiful flowers. Ravi turned to Douglas and asked if it was true that if many flowers fell from the sky, those who saw them would be delighted. Ford confirmed her guess. When the brothel girls appeared in the room with flowers, their surprise knew no bounds. They were surprised that the fake flowers looked like real ones. They couldn't believe that two people, a father and daughter, did this. The girls asked Douglas what his name was. The man remembered that he had not yet introduced himself and said his name. He also introduced Ravi, calling her his daughter. Suddenly the girls were surprised and asked if he was Mr. Guardian Adventurer. Douglas thought that they called him that at Addington too. He asked the girls how they knew this name. They replied that he was very famous. After this, they provided him with a Milton newspaper, which he began to read with surprise. All his adventures were described there. Douglas couldn't understand why he attracted so much attention to himself. The girls told him it was obvious. After all, he was the one who defeated the legendary dragon, and yet Douglas Sand didn't know that he was famous. Madam also had her say. She thought Douglas was just a tough guy, but it turns out he was the one who solved the problem at the Matlock Orphanage. Even she now has a lot of girls who are now free thanks to him. Douglas sheepishly replied that he had guessed, but for it to happen like that. At this time, Veronica entered the room. She looked at Douglas and said that he was rejoicing, thinking that he had performed an act of mercy. Obviously, this is a very nice feeling. He believes he has become famous for his selfless good deeds. He truly is the world's worst hypocrite. The girl's words made Madame very angry. She attacked Veronica with reproaches. What is she carrying? They became debt-free. Thanks to this man. However, Veronica exclaimed that she would never thank him for anything in the world because she didn't want it to look like he saved her. Douglas thought he understood something about Veronica's behavior. However, she quickly left the room and slammed the door and ran out into the street. Douglas called out to stop her, but it was too late. At this time, Princess Rose appeared in the room and told Douglas that Veronica had snapped at him quite sharply. She asked Douglas and Ravi to come out with her for a minute. Douglas and Ravi followed Rose into the garden. The girl apologized for Veronica and said that she was throwing tantrums like a child. She often warned her about this. Douglas replied that this did not bother him at all. He turned to Princess Rose and asked if Veronica had really been sold at the Matlock shelter. Princess Rose asked why he was asking this. Douglas apologized for his arrogance but said he should know about it. Rose asked him if there was a need to shoulder so much. Does he really think about interfering in people's lives wherever he goes and trying to save everyone? This is definitely an arrogant way of thinking. He probably wants to do good, just extend his hand when someone asks for help, as happens when a parent protects a child. Douglas noticed Rose's special way of speaking, as if she were a mother herself. Princess Rose confirmed Ford's guess and said that she also had a child. 
She gave birth to her at the age of 15, and now she is already four years old. Now she is having dinner with other children in the dining room. Rose said that people cannot become commodities. No matter how superhuman he is, there is a limit to how many people he can save, so don't recklessly poke your nose into other people's affairs. Douglas replied that she might be right, but no matter what he does, he can never ignore people who are suffering. In truth, he probably couldn't help, but even if there was one chance in a thousand that he could save someone, he had to lend a helping hand. It was for this reason that he became an adventurer. Rose sighed and told Douglas that he persisted even after everything he said to her. How kind-hearted he is. Douglas corrected her and said he was just stubborn. Princess Rose replied that everything was as he expected. Veronica is an orphan who was sold to the Matlock Orphanage. This story of Veronica began six years ago, when she was nine years old. Douglas exclaimed indignantly and said that Veronica was only nine years old at the time. Princess Rose replied that now their madam is a respected person, but at that time the woman running this brothel was a bastard. She bought children as if it were some kind of routine. One day she found Veronica in the stables when she ran away and hid. She asked in horror who she was. Rose replied that she was her new mentor. Veronica was beaten by Madame and had to treat a wound on her arm. The girl asked Rose why she was so kind to her. Rose tried to calm her down and explained the situation. Then she told Veronica that sold girls like them had nowhere to run. She needs to understand this. If she wants to be free, then she must live here. Over time, Veronica changed. To gain her freedom, she began to save money. This goal practically became her motivation. And six years later, they suddenly received a notice from the military police that their sale was illegal, and from that day on they could be free. All the girls thought that this was very wonderful news and let Veronica go. However, after a few days she returned back. Although she had no more debts, she said that it was all over for her, she had nowhere to go with such a desecrated body. Douglas said bitterly that he was six years too late. Princess Rose apologized for telling Douglas about this. She only added to the burden he now had. Douglas reassured her and said that this was not so. Rather, he feels obligated for what she told him. He asked Rose where Veronica could be now. Princess Rose asked in surprise, is it possible that even if it is useless, he is still going to lend her a helping hand? Douglas replied that he doubted that he was capable of anything so unusual. He just feels like he needs to talk to Veronica. Veronica sat alone on the roof of the establishment and her thoughts were turned to the past when a liar named Matlock introduced her to her new mother madam. At first, this scoundrel promised her that she would meet her real mother. She then prayed for someone to save her. Suddenly someone called out to her. Veronica turned her head and saw Douglas on the roof with a little girl. The girl said that if he is here because of the insults, she is not going to apologize. The former adventurer said that's not what he's here for. Veronica asked him patiently, then why is he here? Just his face makes her sick. Let him get out of here. In the end, he couldn't save them, the victims, and it's not just him. Even though the children became prey, not a single adult came to save them. She asked to stop reminding her of this. Douglas suddenly bowed his head in front of the girl. Veronica asked in surprise what he was doing. Douglas replied that she was right. They, the adults, could not save her six years ago. And not only her. There were many other children who also became victims, and they couldn't save these children. The girl asked in bewilderment why he was apologizing for this. She knows she was just throwing a tantrum. Does he have a reason to bow his head? Douglas thought that if he had been in Addington six years ago, perhaps he could have saved all the children. However, he failed to do this. Young children have been put in danger, and he is hurt by his inability to save them. He definitely needs to apologize. He looked Veronica in the eyes and told her to forgive him for not being able to save her that time. The girl said in despair that this apology was coming now when it was already too late. It doesn't matter what an old man like him tells her, a prostitute who has been defiled over and over again. Her life is already over. Douglas said that was not true. An old man like him is now enjoying a second life. He is sure that a young girl like her has much more opportunities. Besides, the world is huge. 
She can go anywhere if she wants and become anything she wants. He encouraged her not to give up on her own prospects. Veronica asked with hostility whether he was really trying to preach to her again. Douglas leaned over and stroked her head. Veronica asked him what he was doing. He replied that he was just trying to comfort her since she was crying. Ravi also stroked the girl and asked her not to cry. Veronica said that this little guy also annoys her. Let them stop treating her like a child. Veronica buried her face in Douglas's chest and said that usually when they say something like that, it only infuriates him. Ford continued to soothingly stroke the girl's head. In the evening, the streets of the city were filled with people loitering. There were also a lot of people near the brothel. One of the girls invited a man to come over for a drink, and he promised to do so. At this time, flowers rained down on them from the windows of the brothel. People unwittingly admired the flower shower arranged by prostitutes. This was beautiful. One of the women passing by sarcastically asked the men if they were really satisfied simply admiring the flowers from below. Meanwhile, girls from the windows of the establishment called on men to come up to them. They offered to fall in love with the flower they liked at their own pleasure, promising to provide exceptional service to the guests who picked the flower. Many men began to pick flowers and go up to the brothel. At this time, Veronica, being inside the establishment, recalled the words spoken by Douglas. She can go anywhere she wants and become anything she wants. These words haunted her. What does she want to become? The girl thought about this for several quiet days, although they were not entirely calm. From the day Veronica cried her eyes out, Douglas noticed her figure everywhere out of the corner of his eye. She ran away whenever they made eye contact, and if he greeted her, she tried not to respond. She urged him not to become arrogant. Veronica was a very mysterious girl. But today was the last day of his work as a security guard. He turned to Madame, and inquired that when he was originally hired for security, she said that these guys wouldn't cause any more trouble in five days. Does this still apply? The owner of the establishment replied that this was true. Tomorrow the leader of these hooligans, Carlos' father Baron Morse, will return from his journey. He is quite strict with his unlucky son. If they report his wrongdoing, his father will give him a slap on the neck and he will stop pursuing Princess Rose. So they just need to hold out until Morse returns. Douglas told Madame that they wanted to sell the cursed item to Baron Morse, but it would probably not be so easy now that he was in conflict with his son. However, the owner of the establishment said that this would not happen. Although the Baron seems eccentric, he is not a worthless person. Douglas was glad to hear this. He thought that if the Baron returned tomorrow, then today was the only opportunity for Carlos to do something. He hadn't seen him since he chased him away from the brothel entrance. It's good if he's not up to anything. The girls were washing and drying clothes when Carlos appeared. When he saw Douglas, he said that they had not seen each other for several days and ordered him to bring Princess Rose. The guard said he refused. Then Carlos gave a sign and armed bandits rushed to his aid. Carlos looked mockingly into Douglas's eyes and asked if he could repeat his words now. Carlos stated that these guys were experienced mercenaries whom he specially called from Baltzac. They don't compare to some old guy with a classic grip. Douglas realized that it took this bandit about three days to send the horse from Milton to Balzac. So he had only been quiet for the past few days because he was waiting for these mercenaries to show up. Douglas ordered the girls to move back and Ravi to be with them. Then Douglas Ford turned to Carlos and said that anyway, this was too much. If he likes Princess Rose, then he shouldn't continue to bother her. Does he really believe that he can win the heart of his beloved by continuing in the same vein? Douglas admitted that he himself does not understand this, but nevertheless it seems to him that he is missing something. Carlos shouted angrily and ordered him to shut up and not preach the nonsense that his father also preaches. After that, he turned to the mercenaries and ordered them to beat the crap out of this guy. One of the mercenaries asked him why he was so worked up. It's just some old man's ramblings. Suddenly, Carlos's hirelings fell to the ground. He couldn't understand what had happened. 
some of the observers of what was happening thought that perhaps these were some actions of Douglas. But he did nothing and did not undertake anything. Ford turned and looked at the roof of the house. He saw a man on the roof who asked him if he saw his attack. The young man jumped down and said that usually his attack was too fast for anyone to notice. Douglas, looking at him, thought that something was wrong with this man. Although he looks like he's just fooling around, he doesn't have any open spots. Douglas thought that this man was different from anyone he had ever met. Meanwhile, this guy said he wanted to get down to business. The mercenaries groaned as they lay on the ground. They felt as if their insides were on fire. Douglas felt that this man was surrounded by a desire to kill. He used the magic of air power, wind and prevented the impact of needles laced with poison magic, which the stranger directed at the mercenaries. He asked Douglas why he was bothering him. Aren't they his enemies? Ford replied that that was not the case. The stranger laughed and said that he was incredibly gentle. No matter where he went after all, he never fought with the intent to kill. If he was capable of killing without hesitation, he would not have tried to save Fenrir in the first place. Douglas realized that this man was following him since he found out everything about him. He realized with horror that this man's target was Ravi. Meanwhile, the stranger asked Douglas if he had apparently noticed something. He invited him to play a guessing game. If he guesses correctly, he will say, Ding ding, does he really consider himself above this? Then the stranger said quite seriously, pointing to the girl, that he intended to disappear with this rabbit right now. Douglas categorically stated that he would not give him Ravi. Ford realized that although he did not know who this man was, he was definitely Ravi's enemy. The stranger smiled again and said that in this case he would have to kill the old man first. The stranger was preparing for another attack and Douglas was determined to resist him. This guy had poison magic and it was very dangerous. The girls thought in horror, was this evil man really aiming at them? Douglas used air magic, the wind and everyone heard the furious whistle of the wind. At the same time, he used detoxification magic. The former adventurer noticed that the poison was spreading quickly, and at this rate it would take some time until it was completely neutralized. The stranger was surprised at how easily Douglas could handle the simultaneous use of skills. Douglas had to recognize this guy's professionalism. He didn't even notice when he got so close. He had excellent techniques and physical abilities, while moving, he did not make a single sound. Undoubtedly. This guy is an assassin. But this is another reason to find out why such a person targeted Ravi. The assassin used another magic and asked Ford what he would do now. If he interrupts his magic now, he will not be able to attack him, and if he does not interrupt, then prostitutes or hooligans will suffer. The wind increased. It was Douglas who continued to use air magic, wind. The stranger told Ford that he was in vain pretending to be the guardian of this little girl. He whispered angrily that he loved watching people leave each other in trouble. He promised to show Ravi how things work in the adult world. Douglas told him to shut up. This is not what he wants to show her. After this, Ford attacked the assassin, and he expressed annoyance for his actions. The stranger escaped the blow and asked if he could respond to his next step with indifference. Douglas saw sharp blades fly down from the sky. The girls from the establishment were very scared. Douglas Ford thought that if he cancelled the detoxification magic, Carlos and his friends would die. In addition, he is forced to use air magic throughout the sky. The assassin was pleased. He enjoyed watching Douglas look for a way out. Who to leave prostitutes or hooligans, or Ravi? Douglas found himself in a difficult situation. Some blades have already begun to fall to the ground. At that very moment, the assassin stabbed Douglas in the liver. He heard his daughter scream. Dodging, he kicked the assassin. He could sacrifice his body to protect someone. The stranger, taking a stance, said that he was bored. Douglas used air magic. An incredible storm broke out at the battle site. Ravi saw Douglas's bleeding wound and screamed loudly. She thought that Dad was dying. Douglas asked Ravi not to cry and said that he wanted to protect her smile. He doesn't want the person who matters most to him to get hurt. 
and therefore he can do anything. At that moment, a loud sound of electric discharge was heard. The assassin was surprised and asked where he got so much energy after the knife in his belly. Douglas replied that he had someone he had to protect. After that, the stranger pushed off strongly and made a jump, he shouted to Ford that he would simply tear out his heart. Douglas finished his sentence and said that for the sake of his goal, he will surpass all his limits and stop this killer. He turned to the God of Wrath, who commands lightning. He called upon his rage. The magic of thunderclap was in the hands of Douglas. The assassin couldn't believe that this man had yet another spell. It was simply impossible. How could this guy have triple use of skills? Strong thunder rang out over the place of the duel. Douglas, staggering, told Ravi to stay put. First, he will remove the poison from himself using detoxification magic. After that, he again used several skills, including starlight magic and shackles of light. With the help of magical lightning, Douglas managed to knock the assassin to the ground and control him with the help of shackles of light. The stranger asked if he would try to kill him. Douglas realized with surprise that the assassin had already regained consciousness. He replied that he intended to hand it over to the military police. He replied that it was a little worrying because his employer would be angry. Douglas asked who his employer was and why they were targeting Ravi. The assassin replied that he should have asked the girl herself about this. While under Douglas's control, this stranger revealed that Ravi was hiding a mountain of secrets. Ford decided he should end this conversation for now. He asked Veronica and the other girls if they were injured. Then he asked them to look after Carlos and the rest of the bandits. Still under the control of Douglas's magic, the assassin noted that this was his failure after all. After these words, he took out a knife and Douglas did not have time to do anything. The assassin forcefully swelled his hands in the place where the magic was holding him. Douglas realized that he had a knife hidden in his heel. The girls looked in horror at his severed hands. The killer quickly moved away. He stopped for a moment and told Douglas that he owed him for his hands. Ford wanted to give chase but suddenly lost his balance and fell. The bleeding from the wound in the side increased. He thought that he should use the healing skill. It was late at night when Douglas Ford and Ravi reached the mountainous area. The girl, seeing the glowing formations under her feet, told her dad that it definitely looked like ice. Douglas replied that it was a stone, white limestones. This place was very beautiful. It was called a limestone cave. Caves formed from limestone, which is eroded over time by rain and groundwater. The girl asked in surprise whether the water had really washed away such a big hole. Ford responded that it took countless long years to achieve this. Ravi never ceased to be amazed, admiring the beauty of the cave. Douglas invited the girl to stop here and brew herbal tea, which they bought at Grandfather Theo's store. After all, now that they are so far from Milton, they no longer need to rush. Suddenly, in the depths of the cave, some noise was heard, similar to the sound of falling stones. Douglas decided to check out what was going on there, and he and Ravi headed there. It turned out that it was a tricolored garrow, a magical bird that belongs to a rare species. She was so beautiful that her beauty could be seen even in the dark. But for some reason, it seemed that this bird looked somewhat unusual. Ravi noticed that this bird was injured. Douglas realized that it was still the sound of falling stones, one of which obviously injured the bird. He decided to cure her right now. He walked up to her and summoned healing magic. While examining Garo, he never ceased to enjoy her beauty. Her rainbow wings were awe-inspiring. This bird wasn't even tricolored. There were many more colors in its plumage. She was incredible. Perhaps this is a new species that evolved on its own in this cave and Douglas was very happy that he healed her and she is now healthy. Ravi turned to her dad and said that she had the same feeling as when he saved her. It was nice to hear this and it had already been a month and a half since he met Ravi. In other words, at least four months had passed since he left Baltzak. At that time, before he formally joined the group with Alan and the others, there was a time when he simply traveled with them. One day, he asked them something. If a wild monster appeared in front of them, but the monster was peaceful, not hostile. In that case, what would they do with him? The group members were confused by this question. Does Douglas think they should be merciful to the monsters? In that case, he is wrong. All of Alan's group stated that they would have killed the monster for the sake of the future anyway. Douglas was brought out of his thoughts by the exclamation of Ravi, who told him that she had found a bird feather. Looks like she thanked them, 
Ford looked tenderly at the girl who was holding the feather of the amazing Garrow bird in her hands and thought that tomorrow they would arrive in Balzac. He thought that if Alan's group was still in the city, he could return to him the ring that was a reminder of his parents and the catalyst for his curse. Douglas still couldn't sort out his feelings. He assumed they wouldn't be happy to see him again. He needs to move on. In the morning the travelers reached the city of Balzac. They saw a large street sale on the outskirts of the metropolis. There were all sorts of masks, sweets and other products. Douglas was very surprised by the large number of people and the inexplicable commotion. Ravi was surprised to find cookies with her dad's face on the shelves. A huge crowd immediately formed around them, who immediately recognized the man as Douglas Ford, who had returned to the city again. Residents simply rejoiced when they learned this news. Douglas picked Ravi up and asked him what the hell was going on here. A man ran up to him and exclaimed that he was the strongest guardian adventurer. He asked Douglas what he thought about the title of his article. The former adventurer could not understand what article he was talking about. Then this person introduced himself as a reporter from the publishing department of the magical printing house Kashimashi Mirror. He asked Douglas how it went. He explained that thanks to his articles, now the whole city is talking only about him, and on the front page of tomorrow's suburban newspaper, there will be an article, The Return of the Strongest Guardian Adventurer. He happily suggested that newspaper sales were sure to take off again. This unpleasant man was very clingy and asked Douglas to tell him about his travels. He immediately noticed Ravi and said that she was a very charming girl. It's rare to see such beautiful blonde hair. Is it because of her that he became a guardian? Douglas asked him to move away because his daughter was getting scared. One of the fans rushed to Douglas Sand to give him his autograph, declaring that he was the closest friend of the guy who was sitting next to him one day in a tavern. Douglas was quite tired of the persistent pestering of the city residents, and he decided that he needed to get out of here immediately. The former adventurer turned to the magic of the power of charm. He cast a spell that allowed him to hide the people standing in front of him from reality. Douglas used illusion skills, thus disorienting the crowd. Residents of the city of Balzac were perplexed to see that Douglas and Ravi had instantly disappeared. The reporter burst into a smile with joy. This was another one of Douglas Sand's skills. This has never happened before. The legendary hero not only returned, he even showed them his skills. The reporter was very pleased because now the newspaper will contain a record of all the events of today and it will cost only two copper coins. He encouraged people to find their hero and make him show something else. At this time, Douglas and his daughter were already far from the scene of events. Ravi asked him in fear if everything was okay. Ford replied that he used the illusion skill to hide their bodies. He understood that the girl could not see him yet, but he asked her to be patient a little longer. He apologized for scaring her a little. Ravi replied that she was fine. Besides, she is very glad that her dad is popular. Douglas thought that although he had heard about the newspaper article in Milton, he could not think of what it might lead to. The people in Balzac were just making a fuss out of their own curiosity, but either way, it would be a problem if they didn't calm down. How can they survive this turmoil? He thought they might be disguised. After some time, the fugitives entered a small shop. The girl behind the counter greeted the customers, although she couldn't see them yet. Suddenly, they appeared right in front of her nose, which scared her very much. The girl took off her glasses and recognized Douglas. She told him she was glad to see him still alive. It was an employee of the store Lola. Douglas also expressed his joy at their meeting. Lola said that there hasn't been a day recently that she hasn't heard rumors about Douglas. Then she looked at the girl and asked if she was his daughter. Ravi said her name and said that she was very pleased to meet Lola. The store employee asked what Douglas needed today. He was glad that Lola got to the point so quickly. He explained to her that he needed a disguise. The girl agreed with him because it made sense, since it was now impossible for him to walk calmly down the street. She offered him a hat and a wig, and Ravi asked for a fake mustache for Dad. Lola assured that they have other things that Douglas can try on right now. After Douglas Ford changed his appearance, he asked how it looked. Ravi said that this doesn't look like Dad at all and Lola said that he looks just amazing, just like his grandfather, a musician, who doesn't have everything at home. Then Douglas noticed one thing and asked the saleswoman what it was. She replied that it was a magical device, a special powder that allows you to change your hair color for 24 hours. Unfortunately, they only have one left that only changes color to black, so it wouldn't make sense for Douglas to acquire it. But would it work for Ravi? Is he sure he doesn't want to disguise it too? Douglas replied that he didn't want her to have to go into hiding. Suddenly, the former adventurer began to think. After all, earlier Ravi was called by name and said that she had beautiful blonde hair. I'd like to think that people wouldn't chase after such a little girl, but anything can happen. 
At this time, Ravi turned to him and said that if she uses this powder, then she will have the same hair color as her dad. Douglas looked at her carefully and told Lola that he was taking this powder. Then he asked the girl if she knew where the hero Alan's group was now. Lola asked if he really wanted to see Alan and the others. Douglas replied that that was not the point. He's just trying to contact them so he can get back into the group. The girl replied that she did not mean that. Doesn't he feel better that he doesn't have to deal with the hero's group anymore? He looks happier than when he left town. However, Lola could not tell where Alan and his people were. All she knew was that they were in Baltzac until they disappeared a few days ago. Douglas asked if she meant to say that they went to finish off the Demon King. The girl replied that this was unlikely. Apparently, the guild had not yet received any requests to pacify the Demon King. Now there are rumors that they fell into despair and had to flee. Lola said that she personally was definitely relieved that they left. Douglas wanted to know why. Lola replied that they were the cause of all sorts of bad news. This happened shortly after Douglas left the city. Dario from the hero's team began to accumulate debts everywhere, which made everyone hate him, and the merchants found themselves in a difficult situation. This came as a surprise to Douglas. He asked the girl if he really had problems with money. Lola confirmed his guess and said that this was because they had been accepting requests lately, but were constantly failing. The supplies they used are quite expensive. That's why it ended up being a big financial loss for everyone. Douglas asked why they were failing now. Lola replied that disagreements were probably one of the reasons for this. Alan's team was on the verge of collapse. Douglas couldn't believe what was said. Lola continued talking and stated that it was all Dario's mistake. He behaved like a leader and insisted on what was beneficial to him and also insisted on transforming the team with an emphasis on attack. In particular, she heard that Dario suggested that Alan kick Fanny out, since she specializes in healing and cannot help in any way in the attack. The team of the hero Alan, when Douglas was still part of it, and him, the sorcerer, consisted of the sage Edmund and the healer Fanny in the rearguard, as well as the kamikaze swordsman Dario in the vanguard. He, of course, heard about Dario's claims to Fanny at one time, but the team needs such a person. Lola agreed with him and said that unfortunately, Dario got drunk and, in a fit of anger, shouted that Fanny was useless, which angered Alan, who immediately expelled him. Dario did not want to be expelled, he fought with Alan, and everything escalated into a violent quarrel. It was terrible. Douglas thought that it turned out that he had heard about this from random passengers in the carriage at that time. Even though everyone in the past united together to defeat the Demon King. Douglas said every team needs a kind person to resolve conflicts. Lola nodded in agreement and said that by brushing him aside, Alan's group broke up, and yet they brushed aside something so important. It was obvious that even if things were going well at first, things would gradually go wrong. You always need a kind person. So there is no need to worry about anything. The former adventurer agreed with the girl and thought that he still knew nothing about the curse. Is this really the reason? Then Ravi turned to him and asked if these people really offended her dad. Douglas couldn't find an answer. Ford asked Lola for other news besides the news about Dario. The girl said that there was more news about Alan. There are too many rumors going around, and she's not entirely sure if they're true. But they say that he fell ill and became mentally ill, and at the same time became very weak. He definitely looks pale and his eyes are empty. He definitely doesn't seem normal. Douglas realized that after this Alan went missing. But the last time they saw each other, he didn't notice anything like that. What happened over the past few months? The next day, Douglas and his daughter were at the pig's night singing in when the door creaked and someone called his name. It was the owner of the tractor Ihab. He apologized for not being able to show up yesterday. Douglas replied that he took the opportunity to visit him once after a long time. He apologized to the owner for stopping at his place so suddenly. He will try to be careful not to cause a commotion. Ihab was surprised that Douglas seemed so distant. After all, they are friends, and he can stay here as long as he wants. Although now it has become a heavy burden for the townspeople. The moment he became famous, a crowd of Douglas' dubious friends filled the streets. At this time, Ihab's daughter Diana ran into the room and immediately wanted to meet Ravi. She stated that it started to rain heavily outside and she was completely wet. I wonder if the weather will clear up tomorrow, Ravi said that would be nice. At this time, Ihab asked Douglas about his new family. He must be glad and happy now. Ford agreed with this statement. Douglas thought Ravi was shy with strangers, so he was worried about whether she would get along with Ihab's daughter. But it seems that over time, she began to not mind establishing relationships in everyday life. Either way, he was glad that Ravi was able to make friends with someone her own age. At this time, Ihab turned to Diana and asked her to call her mother. The guests began to go down to the tavern to have lunch. Douglas decided it was time for them to disguise themselves. 
he took out a wig and asked Ravi to prepare magic powder. Douglas and Ravi also decided to eat. They were completely unrecognizable. The girl asked Douglas if it was true that they would go from here to another city. Douglas replied that, come to think of it, this was their temporary destination. He thought that since they were constantly traveling, the girl had the impression that it was quite natural for them not to sit still. From now on he will live with Ravi. Whether they continue to travel or settle into family life and settle down is a decision to be made later. He asked the girl what she would prefer to choose, travel or life in the city. While Ravi was thinking about the answer, he said that by continuing the journey, she would be able to meet a variety of people and discover a lot of new things for herself, which has its own attraction. On the other hand, along with home, there will be a place to return to and a sense of security, which will allow you to lead a carefree life. In addition, there is one person, the hero Alan, about whom he spoke to her several times. He has something important to him. If possible, he would like to return it to him in person. He might not be coming back to this town again, but could she just hold on a little longer? Ravi nodded her head affirmatively. After that, Douglas asked her to think about what she wanted to do during this time. And then he asked her to decide what they should do next. Ravi agreed. At this time, a knock came from under the table. It turned out that Diana was hiding there. Ravi asked her why she was doing this, and the girl replied that she was ordered to stay out of sight while working. Then she invited Ravi to go play as soon as the weather cleared. The girls quickly agreed. Then Ravi said that she thought it would be better to play at home. Diana agreed and offered to play with the dolls tomorrow. Douglas asked Ravi why she refused to play with Diana outside. The girl replied that something dangerous had happened before, so it might happen again. Douglas realized that Ravi was referring to the incident with the killer. By this logic, it is easy for him to protect her and forbid her to go out to play, but it would be lousy to continue invading Ravi's personal life. He wanted to do something about it because he had finally become friends with her. Evening came and Ravi went to sleep in the room and visitors continued to arrive at the inn to drink alcohol. Douglas sat thoughtfully at the table and I have asked him if he would like something to drink. The former adventurer refused and said that he was fine, just thinking a little. The owner of the establishment still asked what was bothering him. Douglas replied that it was nothing special, he was just wondering if there was a way to safely pass the time, even if Ravi was attacked by a killer, while he was not around. Ihab was stunned. Is he overreacting with his concern? Douglas replied that he was extremely serious. Douglas remarked that it would be nice if there was some kind of magical device that could protect Ravi in his absence. The ideal would be to get a cuckoo. I have asked if he meant the magic anti-crime cuckoo. Douglas confirmed his guess and said that she would immediately warn him of the impending danger and even try to repel it when he was absent. This is the perfect magical device to protect children in the absence of their parents. I have objected and said that he was making a mountain out of a mountain. Isn't this magical device used to protect big shots? Not to mention that it is unique. There are only a handful of craftsmen capable of making them, and there are even very few workshops in which such devices are made. Douglas interrupted him and said that he knew one place where you could get this device. I have asked him, so he is planning to go to Baltzak's Shop of Magic Tools, also known as the Secret Shop of Magic Tools. Douglas took off his wig and said he would be back soon. Magic tools that are created by masters are support objects that enable adventurers to create various types of effects. Baltzak's Magic Tool Shop is known for dealing in items of particularly rare quality, and is the most famous magic tool shop in the country. However, this shop itself chooses its customers. There is a call gate for this. Douglas approached one of the columns of these gates and placed his palm on its cool edge. He turned to the gatekeeper and asked him to accept his challenge. The gatekeeper was surprised at the client at such a late hour. Only selected warriors can enter through his gate of challenge. He asked Douglas to prove to him that he had power. The gatekeeper always casts unique magic to test those hoping to enter the shop. Only those who pass the tests prepared for them can enter. Last time there were a lot of legionnaire ants for Douglas, but now a squad of golems is waiting for him. These were no ordinary golems. Hundreds of golems made from golden demonic minerals, which boast the greatest strength even among all the unique demonic minerals. The gatekeeper warned Douglas that if he was going to escape, now was the time to do so. The power of the fist released by such a body. Incomparable to an ordinary golem. Their strength is simply incredible. Douglas thanked him for the warning and created a magical barrier. Alas, golem attacks are physical attacks and magic like this. You're unlikely to protect him. The gatekeeper asked what he was doing. Douglas replied that this barrier should not protect him, it should protect the guardian himself from Douglas's attack. The keeper replied that now that he looked closely, he recognized him as Douglas Ford. 
The former adventurer said that his daughter is waiting for him and he intends to give it his all. A flame began to form in his clenched fist. Fire magic. Salamander was supposed to help him. Bright flames rained down on the golems. An incredible roar was heard near the gate. It was the sound of hundreds of golems collapsing. Douglas realized that he had succeeded. The gatekeeper praised him and said that he was such a devil. He passed his test very quickly. In addition, he thanked Douglas for putting up a barrier for him. The shop owners were surprised and curiously asked who passed the challenge gate the fastest in history. This is simply unprecedented. If they pass so easily, won't their store's good name suffer? Douglas greeted Carrie and Esther, the owners of Baltzac's shop of magical instruments, and said that they had not seen each other for a long time. The ladies were surprised that Douglas Ford himself came to their closet. So it was him. Carrie stated that she had already lost her confidence, but realizing that it was Douglas San, she could accept it. After all, lately only spineless fools have been coming here. But why did he decide to take the test? Has he lost his membership card? Douglas replied that he had it with him, but its term had expired because three years had already passed. The store owner quickly took the card from Douglas's hands, which incredibly lit up, illuminating all the hidden corners of the store. Douglas thought that this shop was truly fascinating, just to look at it. He decided that next time he would bring Ravi here. He was sure that she would like it here. After renewing the card, Carrie handed it to Douglas and told him that next time he should just show the card to the gate to get inside. Then she asked him if he was just going to renew his membership card or if he still intended to buy something. Douglas replied that he would come shopping another time. After that, he asked if they had magical anti-attack cuckoos. He also wanted to know the price of them. Esther replied that they would have to be ordered, but they could get them. Carrie asked if he was going to become the princess's bodyguard or something. By the way, it is very expensive and costs 100 gold coins. The price is high enough to cover the construction of a luxury mansion. Douglas thought that he would have to take on several high-paying quests, no matter how you look at it. Still, it's a small price to pay for protecting Ravi. He turned to the store owners and asked them to order an anti-attack cuckoo, and he would come back for it later. After that, they said goodbye and Douglas left the shop. Returning home, Douglas decided to take on a high-paying assignment as soon as possible, preferably tomorrow. Suddenly, he heard someone's quick steps and saw a man who, out of breath, loudly announced to Douglas that he had finally found him. It was a mirror from Kashimashi's magical printing house. He asked the former adventurer why he went to the magic tools shop. How did he get through the challenge gate? This was the last thing he expected from him. Douglas thought with annoyance that he had let his guard down because it was the middle of the night. However, now is the time to take the opportunity to tell this person everything honestly. He turned to the reporter and asked if he could stop chasing him. This causes him trouble. He doesn't want this kind of thing at all. The mirror couldn't even understand what Douglas was talking about because he doesn't even realize how special he is. Douglas Ford is one of a kind. Isn't that why he's so popular? Douglas asked him to keep his voice down. However, the reporter immediately asked him for an exclusive interview. If he does an interview, he will realize how much the townspeople love him and one day he will have events with handshakes and autographs and even a parade with the whole town. Douglas was horrified when he imagined this. The reporter again slipped him a newspaper from the day he was welcomed into the city. He said that people greeted her with great interest. Douglas replied that he was very sorry, but he didn't want anything like that anymore. Then the mirror asked him to at least give his autograph. The next day, Douglas and Ravi went to a place. When they entered the right room, a loud voice said that he had arrived just in time. Douglas asked if he mentioned that he was coming here today. The voice replied that it became obvious when they entered. The owner of such a loud voice turned out to be Ham. He was an informant and belonged to the dwarf race. His ears were sharp as always. Douglas told Ham that he had not changed at all. He introduced his friend Ravi. Selling information for money and brokering quests that were not standard guild business was his main job. But the accuracy and content of the information he possessed was incomparable to other informants in the field, and according to one of them, he was influential enough to take over an entire country. Douglas asked the dwarf how things were going. He replied that the information gathering was going well, but the mediation quests were not going well. There are simply too few adventurers to count on for special tasks. Ham asked in turn if he was looking for a high-paying quest. If he agrees to accept, he has a few problematic quests he'd like to recommend. Douglas replied that he did not mind if they paid a small fee. He asked him to give him some safe job because he didn't want to get into trouble anymore. Ham nodded his head understandingly and said that he believed that nothing could be done about it. After all, he now has someone he must protect. Suddenly, he received a new task, and while he was writing it down, he asked Douglas to wait a second. Ravi asked Dad if it looks like he is going to work. 
Douglas replied that she would go with him. They may have to leave Baltzac for a few days, depending on the assignment, but they will return as soon as they are finished, and then she can go and play with Diana. At this time Ham said he had the perfect fit for Douglas, no one is suitable for this quest except him. He added that this was a search order from a rich man. The reward is not bad, as much as 50 gold coins. Douglas noted that the reward was too good to simply find someone. He asked Ham about security and whether it was a kidnapping. He replied that this was not a kidnapping at all. This is a task to find the daughter of a tycoon who ran away from home, from Ham's explanation, meant that the father was the tycoon Tolkien. His daughter Bridget ran away from home a few days ago. She is 17 years old and this is her second escape. According to Tolkien's secretary, the quest giver, it appears they quarreled regularly. Finding and returning his daughter home is such a quest. Douglas asked if her whereabouts had been unknown for several days, wouldn't he have to search a fairly large area? Ham objected and said that it looked like she was not far from the city. Ford asked, so even if Bridget is somewhere nearby, she cannot be found. The dwarf replied that it looked like the girl had hired someone with the illusion skill. Douglas realized that this was complicating things. The skill he used in the city earlier to hide them was also an illusion skill. As with curses, extremely advanced techniques are used to interfere with a spell being cast and then reverse it. It is for this reason that finding the daughter of a tycoon is impossible for an ordinary adventurer. Ham explained that before the matter was handed over to him, a person from the adventurer's guild took on this task, but was soon removed. Douglas inquired about the reason. The dwarf replied that he was lucky to find and knock her out so he could take her home. But Bridget woke up halfway and eventually ran away, causing him to fail. Apparently, the tycoon got angry at the adventurer and put him through hell. Douglas noted that after all, any father would get angry if his beloved daughter suffered. Ham agreed with him and said that he was the best at this. Ham explained that violence or harm to the tycoon's daughter is prohibited during the assignment. And this time the task includes returning his daughter home. If he gets down to work, he would advise starting with a toy berry. He will prepare the ship, so let him go and find out the details from them himself. Ravi asked with delight if they were going to sail on a ship. Douglas confirmed her guess and said that the Toyberry is a tourist attraction known for its beautiful beaches. And if they have free time, he and Ravi will swim together. It's been getting hot lately so this will be great. Douglas decided to take action and contact them. Ham reminded us that the departure was tomorrow. Suddenly, a man burst into the room where the conversation was taking place, who shouted that he knew it. Even when they were together, whenever it came to solo work, he came here. As he really returned to this city, he heard that Douglas had regained his powers. Douglas recognized with interest the man as Dario, a former member of the Heroes Group, the Kamikaze Swordsman. He expressed a desire to also take on this quest and make easy money with Douglas. In the morning, Douglas, Ravi and Dario went to complete the quest. Ford greeted Dario and suggested that he hurry up. It was very cool, and the harbor Ham mentioned was still far away. Therefore, the partners were still moving towards her. Douglas felt awkward. Come to think of it, they had always acted together as a group before, and he had never had a chance to talk to Dario individually. It is possible that he will be embarrassed to work with him because of those rumors about Dario appearing in the city. But still, Douglas hoped that this quest to find the runaway daughter of a rich man would bring them closer and everything would be really good. Either way, he needs to start a conversation. Douglas looked at Dario and asked what had happened to him lately. He heard that he left the hero group. Having said this, Douglas thought that he had probably said something wrong again. Dario noticed that his habit of speaking delicately every time in an awkward situation had not improved at all. Ford asked if it was true that he had a big fight with Alan. Dario replied that it was true. They continued to fail even quests not related to the Demon King, so he quit the damn band. Douglas asked, what about the fact that he's broke? The kamikaze swordsman replied that it was true. He acquires new weapons, but inevitably they break easily. In addition, since he left the group, Stores doubted that he would be able to pay, and then he could not charge it to his account. If only he had never given them their money back. At that moment he learned that Douglas had returned to the city. It was luck. And that's all that matters. Douglas noted that he nevertheless seemed to be talking to him normally, and it always seemed to him that Dario clearly hated him to the core. The swordsman said that it was so. The hero group is a special group of selected people who have talent. Just by being in it, you gain the right to quests, great trust and rewards. However, Douglas in his later years was terribly weak and pathetic to look at. This was why, even though he could have simply resigned, his desire to curry favor with the group of heroes seemed like he was trying to hold them back. Dario was disappointed. He couldn't see him, the former leader in this state. 
Dario asked Douglas if it was true that he was now completely healthy and no longer had any debts. If that's the case, then he has no reason to hate him. Douglas liked Dario's frankness. Meanwhile, he asked why he became weak. Ford thought about whether he should tell him the truth or not. He probably shouldn't keep this a secret. He hugged his comrade and said that the truth is that Alan cursed him. Dario himself said the last words for him and laughed. What did he do to deserve this? Douglas replied that he himself did not know why. The kamikaze swordsman asked him what he planned to do next. Just don't let him pretend to be a fool. He came back here on purpose. Didn't he do this to beat the crap out of that Alan? Douglas replied that he had no such intention, he just wanted the ring back. Dario advised him to go to the guild and leave him there, because he would not willingly give him a satisfactory answer. Douglas replied that he just wanted to chat with him. For example, he would ask why Alan did such a bad thing, if he had a grudge against him or something like that. Although in his heart Douglas felt relieved that he had not bumped into Alan in the city. He wondered if he should still meet him. At this time, Ravi woke up, who was in Douglas's arms. She stretched sweetly and Ford wished her good morning. Dario looked at the girl and said that she looked like a doll. Joyful Douglas said that she is his daughter and she is really charming. Dario was surprised and asked if Douglas had really become stupid during this time. Douglas did not have time to answer his comrade to this remark, since they were called by Ham's informant who was supposed to transport them to Toy Berry. He stated that his name was Viagio and he was the captain of the ship that was at the pier. The mercenaries climbed onto the deck of the ship, and Ravi was very surprised by the unusual appearance of Viagio because he was a lizard. She called him Lizard San and Douglas was forced to apologize to the captain. However, this did not bother him at all. He said that it was just baby talk. After that, the ship set sail and easily glided over the waves. RVI was delighted. Vigio, looking at her joy, asked if this was her first time on the ship, and she should be happy. The girl nodded her head happily. The captain asked Douglas how they were doing with food. Douglas replied, he thought there was food on the ship. Vigio said Toy Berry is about half a day's drive along the coast. He offered to catch some fish. Ravi asked the captain if they were going to catch fish using a net. He replied that the net is only suitable for rivers, she will soon see everything with her own eyes. Captain Viaggio approached the side, looking for something in the water. Then a long tongue darted from his mouth into the water, which deftly snatched a large fish from the depths of the sea. Soon there was enough fish to cook dinner. Viaggio looked at the catch and said that should be enough. Ravi began to count the fish, and Douglas was surprised at the original fishing technique of their captain. Viaggio Garoto replied that this was his one and only specialization. Then he asked Douglas if he could use ice magic. Lizards can eat fish raw, but for human consumption the fish must be frozen at least once to kill the parasites. Although he had heard that precise control of magic was tedious. If he wants, he can freeze the entire box of fish. Douglas quickly used his ice magic and froze the fish in a large piece of ice. The captain was very surprised at his abilities. Then Viagio defrosted it and added some seasoning and declared that the dish was ready. People saw delicious pieces of fish laid out on a special dish and were surprised at the speed of Viagio's culinary abilities. Dario said with caution that he had never eaten raw fish. Ravi asked Douglas if this dish was edible. Douglas answered hesitantly that it was possible. Then he saw a saucer with some kind of liquid and asked Viagio what it was. He replied that it was called soy sauce. It's similar to when they ferment grains. The fact is that his older brother trades in the east and there they sold him this, saying that it was a local dish. The girl noticed that it was black. Vigio asked if they didn't like it. If they prefer another, then he can cook differently. At this time, Dario dipped a piece of fish into the sauce and exclaimed that it was delicious. Ravi also liked the sweet and salty taste. Vigio invited the girl to eat another piece. Everyone began to eat the prepared dish with appetite. The ship's passengers were very pleased. It was a real treat. They were surprised at this extraordinary taste and did not bother to praise Vigio. The captain seemed pleased. He said that actually, he has other seasonings. There is one green one. But Douglas interrupted him and said it was too early for children to try this. The ship continued on its way, its rigging creaking. The sea became rough and the sea began to roll. Ravi asked with caution whether this rocking would sink the ship. The captain was also worried and said that this was a really strange motion. Although the wind and waves seemed calm. After all, his twelfth eldest brother has experience in weather forecasting. The girl was surprised and asked the lizard if he really had twelve older brothers. Baijiu replied that he actually had fifteen brothers and sisters. Many lizardmen have large families. He in turn asked Ravi if she was the only child in the family. She can't know what it's like to have many brothers and sisters. This is still a headache. Douglas saw a sad Ravi standing alone at the side of the ship. 
he asked her what happened. The girl replied that she was fine and the captain suggested that she rest in a room on the lower deck. At this time, the ship rocked violently and the passengers were doused with water. Douglas asked what happened. One of the sailors told the captain the bad news, they were attacked by a squid. They were actually attacked by a giant squid which engulfed the ship with its multiple tentacles. The captain shouted loudly. Douglas thought that isn't the Kraken an S-rank monster? This is not the kind of monster found in coastal waters like these. The ship was rocking violently. At this time, Dario made a dash and rushed to the stern, where the Kraken was rampaging. Douglas noticed that the swordsman was faster than when he knew him. Moreover, it looks like his legs don't even need strengthening. Dario exclaimed, why don't he have some fun before starting the quest? In his hands was a magical weapon. A dispersing blade, a meteor shower hit the deck. Everything was filled with roar and crackling. Dario said that the monster has already reached its limit. He cut off part of the squid's tentacles. Nothing less was expected from someone who was once in the heroic squad. At this time his weapon was destroyed. The black block of the monster towered high above the ship. However, he continued to destroy the ship, rocking it. Ravi flopped onto the deck and Douglas inquired about her condition. The girl said that she was in pain. At this time the squid approached again. Dario noticed that this monster was just big. Suddenly he was thrown back and he thought that it was Douglas who used wind magic. He even cursed him. Suddenly Dario noticed his friend's distorted face. He was casting an ice spell. He told him that he would deal with this monster right now. He was extremely furious. Douglas used the ultimate ice magic, the Ice Falcon of Raxus. He called upon the Ice Falcon to freeze the monster. The water around the giant squid instantly turned into an iceberg. The crew and passengers of the ship looked with horror and admiration at the huge mountain of ice that had formed in the place of the monster that had just splashed. The captain sighed with relief and said that they were saved. Douglas sat Ravi down on the bed in the cabin and called upon magic, complete healing to heal the girl's wound received on deck. He asked her, is she in pain now? At this time, the door creaked and Dario entered the room, who said that they were leaving in half an hour. He said that Squid would be transported on another ship. They said that the reward for pacification was with the informant. This is a lot of money. Then Dario smiled and asked Douglas what kind of ice model it was. Is he stronger now than in his heyday? It's not every day you see top class magic. Ravi asked what is upper class. Dario was surprised that she didn't know this and replied that it was a skill rating. There are general skills called basic magic. Those that change the shape or power of objects are called first class magic. And those that give rise to life belong to the highest magic. For example, complete healing is also considered high class magic. Dario turned to Douglas and said that he seemed to be able to use it easily, but it was not a skill that he used for any scratches. Even his useless fanny couldn't use it. Douglas asked his friend not to speak like that. Dario objected and said that he speaks as it is. Ravi turned to her dad again and said that she wanted to practice magic. Douglas replied that of course she could practice. He explained to Dario that Ravi has been practicing magic since the days of Floria, the elven forest, but she still has not achieved any results. He wants to do something for her and he will demonstrate a series of measures once they come to the city. Meanwhile, the girl put her palms in front of her and began to read a light magic spell, Radiance. Dario asked her if she couldn't use magic. Doesn't that mean she lacks ability? The girl energetically replied that she had abilities. Douglas confirmed that Ravi's skill potential is at least 5,000. Dario was surprised and said that then this is enough for the lower upper class. The sage class has at least 8,000, if he is not mistaken. Dario asked the girl what kind of magic she wants to learn. Ravi replied that she wanted to learn light magic. The swordsman asked her that it was obvious that this was not the first time she had seen this magic. She must have seen many others in the past, and despite this, why did she choose light magic? Dario looked at the girl and said that the first magic gave rise to a strong desire. He asked her to try to remember why she chose light magic, and then, if she has a predisposition to it and she figures out what the trick is, it won't take her much time to learn. Douglas looked thoughtfully at Dario. The swordsman asked him what he was addicted to. He was also taught these things before. Douglas responded that he was bad at expressing his feelings in words. At this time, Ravi asked Dario what magic did he learn first. Douglas knew that Dario was the only one in the heroes group who could not use magic. He quickly told her that no one knew. Dario confirmed that he had already forgotten. After that, the swordsman announced that he was going to bed and let dad teach her everything else. He asked them to wake him up as soon as they arrived. The door slammed and Douglas thanked him belatedly. Douglas caught up with him on deck and said that he was surprisingly good at taking care of others, something he had never noticed while they were in the group. He's good at teaching. 
Dario replied that it was just for fun. Douglas replied that he was very happy for him. He then said that something happened during the discussion, and he didn't take it very well. It seems that he and Ravi reminded him of something that upset him. Dario looked closely at Douglas and said that it was a surprise. In this case, let him not try to delve into the past again. Alan would be angry with him for doing this. After all, he is not of the same blood as this girl, and he is not related to her. Douglas agreed with him, but said that they were now a real family. Dario said that he already understood this. He also had one family, and they were not related. Ten years ago, when he was only 12 years old, he lived in a village where only children lived. He grew up in one nameless place. The children got along well with each other, and Dario was an authority among them. They revolved around him and constantly asked for something. Dario was something of a brother among the children. The inhabitants of this place ate their food right on the floor of the wretched building. But the food seemed delicious and life seemed eternal. There were twelve children living in an unnamed village. The main difference from the orphanage was that there were no adults in the village. The eldest of them was called San and he was in charge. This name was given to him by his younger children for one simple reason. Because the day always clears up when the sun appears, without their parents they lived quite well in this place. Dario gave his portion of food to one girl, because San was in charge of cooking that day, and he hated that his food was always full of leaves. San told Dario to eat this grass too, because he was not growing at all. San decided that someday he would leave this settlement to fill the bellies of these children to the brim. San asked the children, have they seen a skill book anywhere? Then he turned to Dario and asked him to go away with him for a minute. San was wearing his cape, which he never parted with. This was important to him. He reminded Dario that he intended to leave this village tomorrow, and asked him to express his opinion. He informed him of the disaster that had befallen the country. A few months after the creature called the Demon King appeared among the demons, a rumor began to spread that in places near the dungeons where monsters were born, monsters that had not previously existed began to appear. San told Dario that a selection exam was being held in Baltzac for the squad that would be sent to pacify the Demon King. He had heard that they judged candidates based on strength, regardless of background or upbringing. If he can get into this squad, they won't have to worry about money anymore. And even if nothing works out, he can be hired into the military police. They have a supply of food for the children for several months. Even if the elders left, they could manage on their own for a while. San looked into Dario's eyes and asked if he wanted to go with him. Dario, without hesitation, answered that he was not interested. This doesn't mean he plans to live here forever, but he doesn't have the slightest idea how to defeat the Demon King. And even more, he doesn't like the idea of being at one with people he doesn't care about. He told San that he would stay here and wait for him to return. San became sad, but nodded understandingly. Then he smiled, hugged Dario and said that in this case, they would organize the last hunt tomorrow, and he would definitely get the kids a deer. Dario happily agreed. They actually harvested a deer the next day. Having butchered it, they divided the burden between two and went to the settlement. San boastfully asked Dario if he had seen his skill with a spear. Dario in turn boasted about his knife. They were already going down the path to the village when San, walking ahead, stopped abruptly. Dario asked him what was the matter. And then they saw a terrible picture. There were dead children lying on the street of the settlement. Dropping their burdens, San and Dario rushed forward. Then San ordered Dario to stop and said that there was someone here. They hid around the corner of a dilapidated building and began to watch. They saw a wounded monster sniffing vigorously. A human hand was sticking out of its mouth. Dario said with horror that this creature ate someone's hand. San whispered that it was a demon. He saw his picture in the newspaper. A humanoid and intelligent evolved monster. Dario asked his older comrade why he was in such a place. Sun replied that he didn't know it, but the monster was seriously injured. He must have escaped here from somewhere. He asked Dario to find someone, maybe there are adventurers nearby, and he will look for the children when this creature leaves here. From the side where the monster was, groans were heard. Suddenly the demon was right in front of them. San instantly raised his spear and Dario pulled out a knife. They attacked the beast with hatred and contempt. The onslaught was so unexpected and rapid that the seriously wounded demon was unable to offer worthy resistance. Dario screamed that they managed to kill him. He turned to his comrades, who could not answer anything and rejoice at the victory over the demon. They were all killed by him. Dario rushed to San, who was bleeding against the destroyed wall. The young man said that everything will be fine, and he will now find someone to help San. He asked Dario for forgiveness, and said that every time he woke up in an unfamiliar forest, where no one was around, he was in despair because he was abandoned. He wanted to be with someone, so when he came across the abandoned Dario, he was overjoyed. Dario couldn't understand what his friend was talking about. 
The older comrade continued to speak, overcoming the pain. He said that Dario would be lonely and there was no reason for him to stay here anymore. You don't have to do this just for the sake of the children. From now on he must be free. Sand died and it started to rain. Standing in the pouring rain, Dario thought that he was the only one left and therefore must live on. He remembered the last words of his older friend. Although the children are here, he will be lonely if he leaves, so he will leave this memory here with him. Dario didn't shed any tears, he was just constantly thirsty. No matter how much he screamed, the healing magic he practiced did not work. He doesn't seem to have any talent for magic. And then he decided that in this case, he would kill monsters with his bare hands. Dario remembered the qualifying exam that San told him about, and he went to Baltzac. Douglas listened to Dario's story with growing excitement. The swordsman looked into his eyes and said that Ravi was his child and that he should do everything in his power to be by her side. It was the first time Douglas had seen such a pure look from his former comrade, and he simply could not talk to him further because of the lump that had risen in his throat. After some time, Viagio reported that they had arrived at the scene. He stated that he needed to sell some goods so they would have to part ways. He said that he visited this harbor every three days, and if they were going back with him, then they should wait for him here. Douglas Ford thanked the captain for everything, and the lizard expressed the hope that they would see them again. Ravi, coming ashore, admired the beauty of this place. She was surprised that there were so many people here. Dad agreed with her, although in reality there weren't that many people here. Douglas turned to Dario and said that he planned to head out to sea as soon as they were done with this task. He asked him why don't they swim together. Dario tried to refuse, but Douglas strongly insisted. Dario gave in and Douglas breathed a sigh of relief. After that, they headed to Tolkien, the quest giver, to find his runaway daughter. The mansion in which this man lived was incredibly majestic. There was a fountain in front of the facade, and large white marble statues stood on the sides of the building. Tolkien met them, lounging in a chair. He turned out to be a rather impressive old man and looked down on the mercenaries. Douglas found that there was a generally frightening atmosphere in his office. There was always a person next to Tolkien. The former adventurer asked the merchants at the port about Tolkien, but no one told him that he made such a depressing impression. This mansion and the interior are too extravagant. Who is he? Meanwhile, the rich man stirred in his chair and asked, looking predatorily at the mercenaries, if they were Douglas Ford and Dario San. They answered in the affirmative. The man next to the owner's chair said that he was acting as Mr. Tolkien's secretary and his name was Alfred Kane. It was he who issued the quest to the agent on the instructions of Mr. Tooth Tolkien. For some reason, Douglas and Dario felt afraid. Dario, Douglas and Ravi, who set out to find a girl who ran away from home to buy a magical criminal cuckoo, arrived at the mansion of the incredibly rich Mr. Tolkien, located in Toy Berry, and were faced with an unusual situation. Tolkien rudely asked Alfred why he brought some nondescript people to him again, even though he specifically sent the request to the informant because the adventurer's guild is unreliable, absolutely nothing has changed. Alfred objected to the gentleman and said, pointing to Douglas, that the name of this guardian adventurer flashes in the newspapers every day. Tolkien, lighting a cigar, asked, so what? Didn't he say that strength is everything? These guys will be the same as the ones he kicked out. Dario looked at the rich man with hostility. He pulled out a dagger from its sheath and said, turning to the old man, that he would immediately cut his throat if he lit a cigarette. He hates smoke. Is he really going to do this in front of the guests? At least thought a little about the situation. Douglas asked Dario why he was suddenly furious. Then he looked at the cigar in Tolkien's hands and decided that Dario must be worried about Ravi in his own way. He apologized to the old man for his comrade's rudeness and said that he understood that he was alarmed by the action of his daughter who ran away from home. However, if he doesn't mind, they could talk outside. Today the weather is good and he is sure that the conversation will go better there in the air. The former adventurer thought that they must have angered the old man. Looks like they won't be able to do this job. Suddenly Tolkien began to cry and said that they were wonderful people who cared about their daughters and he had already driven away thirty adventurers. In truth, he had heard that some guardians had come to take on the task, but he had suspicions that this was another trick motivated by gold. However, no matter how adults act, children behave sincerely. The old man looked Douglas in the eyes and said that this complete trust on the part of his daughter showed him how much he valued her. After this, Tolkien sincerely asked for forgiveness for testing them. He even ruined his mood. Douglas hastened to reassure the unhappy father and said that everything was fine. Meanwhile, the old man rose from his chair and declared that his name was Tolkien and he worked as a merchant. He glanced at the mercenaries and formally asked them to take on his task. He said that all this happened ten days ago. His daughter Bridget came home from the Magic Academy for the summer holidays and said that she wanted to go somewhere. 
He gave her pocket money, but she suddenly exploded and ended up throwing the money at him. So that the girl would not have any bitter thoughts after the death of his wife, he planned to make every effort to work and raise his daughter. He couldn't believe that she would throw that gold right in his face, he lost his temper and they quarreled after that. Douglas asked the old man, so after that she ran away from home. Tolkien answered in the affirmative and sighed heavily. The merchant said that Bridget was definitely wrong for what she did. However, he also regrets that he was too harsh with her. Once they find his daughter, he wants them to tell her he's sorry. When the mercenaries were on the street, Dario asked if this old man's head was not bewitched by gold. Douglas replied that he had no choice because the company could not do without him. Douglas agreed with what Dario was saying. All this was clear. Even if they bring Bridget back, only Tolkien himself can resolve this disagreement between him and his daughter. However, the former adventurer was sure that he was also worried. Because there is no father who does not think about his child. Mr. Tolkien owned three hotels. He believed that his daughter Bridget could live in one of them. The reason for this belief lies in the fact that due to the illusionists accompanying his daughter, regular employees cannot find her. Therefore, the mercenaries decided to check these hotels first. Douglas considered it necessary to use magic for this. He read a certain spell from the Book of Knowledge. Using magic, assessment, they were able to check all three hotels very quickly. But there was no reaction. Dario was annoyed that Bridget was not at any of the three hotels. What the hell is the matter? Ravi, watching Dad's magical actions, asked him if this could tell if there was someone in the hotel who had run away from home. Douglas laughed and said that this would be a simple way to find out if there were any illusions being used here. However, if there is a reaction, then there are illusionists here. And if there are illusionists, then Tolkien's daughter should also be nearby. Dario shouted irritably, looking into the bushes, so that whoever was hiding there would pull himself together and come out already. The mercenaries were surprised to notice that Mr. To Tolkien and his secretary Alfred Kane were hiding in the bushes. The merchant sheepishly said that he had only come to inspect his hotels. He apologized and said that now was not the time to work. The old man turned to Douglas and asked his permission to also look for his daughter with them. The former adventurer asked him if there were any other places where his daughter could stay. Tolkien replied that he still had six country houses and perhaps she was hiding in one of them. Then the old man corrected himself and said that he probably still had five houses because Bridget could not possibly be in that hut. Douglas eagerly asked what kind of hut we were talking about. Tolkien replied he was talking about a country house that he bought before work got going. However, he is in a dense forest with insects and animals. Even when Bridget was a child, they had only been there a few times. The old man could not imagine that she would go there of her own free will. Douglas asked the merchant. Apparently he means that it is better to check the expensive places first. Tolkien confirmed these words and said that obviously she would be delighted with them, because she was a girl after all. Douglas thought that at least Ravi had never been in such houses before. Dario said that none of this is important. Either way, now that they have a lead, they need to go and check it out. Suddenly Douglas noticed that Ravi wanted to say something. She muttered that perhaps she had misunderstood everything, but she had one idea. Douglas squatted down and asked her to tell them what she was thinking. The girl stated that she thought about that hut in the forest. Aren't the memories dear to her heart? After all, she was there as a child, and the memories associated with his dad are dear to her. I wonder if there are many of them there. Douglas smiled and stroked the girl's head. He said she was just a miracle. After all, he didn't even think about it. Then he asked Tolkien if he and Bridget had ever been anywhere other than that country house in the forest. The old man replied that he didn't think so, because he was very busy with work. However, they were in that hut for a very long time, and he is not sure that this can be called their dear memories. Douglas noticed that a child's heart is much richer than they, adults, think. The old man replied that he had never thought about it, and Douglas advised him to start doing it. After that, the whole group went into the forest towards the hut. Suddenly Dario raised his hand in warning. Tolkien stated that the country house was a little further away, but something was wrong. Douglas looked around carefully and stated that they were all in a different place because the illusion of the lost child effect was imposed on the forest. Douglas invoked the magic of dispelling illusions. Mr. Tolkien was incredibly surprised by the power of this spell. Usually you need special items to use dispel illusions, the preparation alone takes a week. Douglas asked the old man if he was familiar with this. In any case, the illusion disappeared, and Douglas suggested approaching the country house. Everyone saw a small, neat house deep in the forest between the trees. Douglas noticed that the lights were on in the windows, and he thought that, most likely, Bridget was inside. He praised Ravi and patted her head. Everyone was about to enter the house, but Douglas suddenly stopped them. 
Tolkien casually asked what is it? Does Douglas think he should still stay here and wait? Looking intently into the merchant's eyes, Douglas asked if he was really telling him this after they had already come so far. Then the old man said that, to be honest, when his daughter left, she left a note saying that she would not return home until he started over with a clean slate. Tolkien admitted that he still did not understand the meaning of these words. Even if everything worked out this time, once it escalated into an argument again, then his daughter would probably hate him. The old man admitted that it all sounds pathetic, but he thinks that he does not have the courage to look his daughter in the face. Douglas asked in bewilderment if he didn't have enough courage. Dario indignantly asked Tolkien if it was his avoidance of her that led to this. If he does not understand the feelings of the child that he neglected, then first let him look her in the face. Fathers are no exception. After this, the kamikaze swordsman gave a good kick to the fat rich man, who rolled head over heels towards the house. Alfred Kane only had time to shout words of caution to him. The girl inside the building rushed to the door and heard a sound. At this time, someone warned her from behind. The girl opened the front door and shuddered. In front of her stood a man with a girl on his shoulders. He told her it was nice to meet you. Douglas saw a woman behind the girl and asked her, is she obviously an illusionist? Then he asked if the first girl was Mr. Carr's Tolkien's daughter, Bridget. Bridget stated that there was something like a crash. The illusionist Tanya laughed and said, isn't this just her imagination? Having let Douglas into the house, Tanya the illusionist immediately bolted the door. Bridget admitted that she was Tolkien's daughter and apologized for dragging him into his quarrel with his father. Douglas decided to get straight to the point. He asked what she wanted. The girl admitted that his question came as a surprise to her. She thought that he would immediately start trying to convince her to return home as soon as possible. Douglas replied that this was certainly true. However, if he doesn't know what she's thinking, no matter what he does, everything makes no sense. It seems like her father just wants to make peace. He asked what needs to be done to make her forgive him. The girl replied that her father knew nothing. Since her mother died, her father has been working full time until now, and she is offended that he believes that she will be content if he just gives her money. Whenever her father had a day off, all he brought her was sadness. My father never understood how empty it felt to be completely alone in a large, deserted country house. She wanted to spend the weekend with him, but her father just shook his head. He might change if she could convey to him that she was lonely. But she wondered, what if he still refused? And then she won't even be able to talk to him after that. Douglas thought about it. So that's the thing. People are complex creatures. Something that can be easily worked out if one makes his feelings known often drags him into a confusing labyrinth. Tolkien moved away from Bridget, believing in the correctness of his actions, and the girl was overwhelmed with emotions to such an extent until everything went too far. Douglas asked Bridget if this meant that the reason she ran away from home this time was because she was lonely because she couldn't spend the weekend with her father. The girl lowered her shoulders and confirmed his guess. Suddenly a voice was heard in the room. Bridget and Tanya shuddered. This voice was very similar to Tolkien's voice. Douglas snapped his fingers. He dispelled the illusion he had cast before. Bridget saw her father standing in the middle of the room. The illusionist Tanya was surprised that this guy had the skill of illusion. Even though illusionists were supposed to have the perception of illusions, she didn't notice anything. Bridget also expressed surprise that they didn't even notice the illusion hiding her father. Douglas explained that he copied the actions of this girl named Tanya. Bridget blushed and asked, so while she was talking about her feelings for her father, he was listening to her the whole time. Douglas did not deny this. At this time, the father fell to his knees and asked his daughter for forgiveness. He swore that he knew nothing about her feelings, and it seemed to him that the best way to get rid of loneliness after the death of her mother was a rich lifestyle. He expressed sincere regret that he had never realized his mistake after all these years. He turned to the girl and said that he wanted her to at least know that all his actions were for the sake of her happiness. He may have made the wrong choice, but there wasn't a day when he didn't wish her happiness. It was clear from Bridget's eyes that she had forgiven him. Then they sat at the table, and the daughter asked her father if he was going to bed. Tolkien replied that he was fine. More importantly, he bought a new country house, and he's sure she'll love it this time. Let her have fun instead of him. Bridget looked kindly at her father and said what a fool he was. She always knew about it. At this time, Alfred Kane and Dario were on the lawn in front of the house. They heard exclamations coming from the house, and Dario asked the servant if he was sure he wouldn't go there. Alfred replied that it would be better to leave them alone. Doesn't it seem that way to Dario? Kane stated that he would like to correct one of Dario's comments regarding his master. Tolkien was not at all consumed by greed. Dario interrupted him and said that all this was done for the sake of his child. He knows it. Alfred noted that it was not only for the sake of his daughter. 
his master takes the money he earns from trading and uses it to help the orphans find work. Dario was very surprised by this news. Alfred said that in the last few years, monsters have become rampant again. Even though he was alone in this endeavor to give a future to many orphans, he also devoted his sleep to work. However, Tolkien also used to be an adventurer, which may be evidence of why he saved so many people. Dario laughed cheerfully and said that he would never have believed that the old man was not bad at all. Cain continued talking. He didn't know why Tolkien stopped being an adventurer. Perhaps this happened because of the daughter or because of something else. To be fair, he was also an orphan and thinks that his master adopted him during one of his adventures. Unfortunately, he was seriously injured back then and his memory still hasn't recovered, but he will never forget the warm touch of his palm when he adopted him. This man has always lived for someone for a long time. Dario was deep in thought. Scraps of pictures from the past flashed before him. Suddenly, he took the medallion from his neck and handed it to Alfred Kane. Dario said that this thing belongs to him. However, whenever he looks at her, he feels strangely nostalgic. This is what he treasured most in the past. Again, pictures of the past flashed before Dario and the moment of San's death appeared before him as if it were a recent event. He covered his face with his hands and Alfred asked him what happened. Dario asked him to shut up. The stern and merciless kamikaze swordsman cried. He was so happy when he was with him, but he completely forgot about him. He then apologized to Alfred for kicking his master so hard. It turns out that Tolkien is a wonderful person. Cain agreed with this statement and Dario thought that they were all still children, he did not think at all that everything would turn out this way. It was difficult and awkward for him to look someone in the face.